your computer decided to not cooperate with you now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? Or the worst is like we use Google for a lot of platforms. And of course, right when I join a meeting, it signs me out. So yeah. I have to log back in and then I'm just like, sorry, everyone, I was logged out. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Karina Mar... I say your middle name, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Marcia Harris. Thanks. Karina, you ready to be great today? Yes. Growing up by the part of Tacoma, Karina has always had a genuine interest in maritime due to the various ships pulling in and out of Tacoma. Taking the interest and the passion in consideration, Karina went to the California Maritime Academy to study international business and logistics. Upon graduation, she was able to obtain a position with Washington Maritime Blue as a community and events coordinator, and then later trans transitioned into a program manager. Both roles have helped her promote new innovations, technology, community building, and job creation within her hometown, Tacoma. Karina, Karina currently is in Tacoma and can also be found with a dog. Karina, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Jason. I'm super excited. So first question, Talk about your dog. What kind of dog, what type of dog do you have? Yeah, of course. So I have a miniature golden doodle and her name is Diana. I actually named her after Wonder Woman. Everyone thinks she was named after Princess Diana, but she was actually named after Wonder Woman. And the story behind that is Diana is actually the runt of the litter. And the breeder kind of warned me to let me know that she might not make it. So I gave her a powerful name like Diana to help her fight. And she did. And she's very, very healthy and doing just fine now. And how long have you had the, 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 your puppy? I've had her for almost three years. So she'll be three in November. And so it's a golden doodle, right? Yes. Why, why that type of dog versus all, like all the rescues you could get or whatever? Yeah, well, I picked a golden doodle because a previous partner of mine had golden doodles and I really, really liked their temperament, how sweet they were, as well as how smart that they are and the personality. And every time that there was a litter, there was always a dog that I would attach to. And Diana was the one that came to me for the litter, she came and sat down in front of me. And then after that, I kind of knew that that was my dog. Yeah, people don't know that, you know, a long time ago, my, 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 my son, a dog is like eight years old. Went to a breeder, right? Cause my son wanted a pit bull. I wanted a pit bull too. And the, and the, and the, what's the breeder told me, I said, I didn't know, right? He said like, he, so he had, was like, he had like a hundred dogs or a hundred puppies. He must have walk around after 30 minutes on like four or five dogs left, right. And then only two dogs left, right. And one dog was really, really aggressive. One was like, you know, like really nice. And so we picked a nice dog, right? I had no idea you picked a dog like by walking around that the dog come to you, right? Yes. The dog does come to you. The dog does pick you. I didn't really believe that at first until Diana picked me to be her owner. Yes. Now, your type of dog, it's like a, a, um, a I won't say a made up dog, but someone bred those dogs specifically, right? I think so. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the main reasons why people did that is golden retrievers. I have heard, I don't know if this is true because I haven't had just a, a golden retriever on its own, but I have heard a lot of the times golden retrievers shed a lot. And I've heard that too. Yeah. I personally can't have a dog that sheds a lot. Otherwise it'll make me sneeze and stuff. So what's really, really nice about the golden doodle is that it does shed, but not to the extent where, you know, hair and stuff is everywhere. And then you got to vacuum every day. And, um, and I do have to take her to the groomers too, which my advice to anyone is that if they get a golden doodle, be prepared for the grooming bill, because not very many people realize that as well. Um, every eight to 10 weeks, I do have to take Diana to get a haircut. And I prefer it that way because that way, you know, um, the fur is much easier to maintain, just like human hair, if you get it cut regularly. And on top of that, too, there's tedious chores that Diana doesn't like me doing, okay. such as trimming her nails and brushing her teeth. But she'll let the groomer do it just fine. Okay. You, have you been a dog lover all, all, all your life? Have you already had dogs in your house, even as a little kid? I've had dogs. So my godmother had a keys hound and his name was Blueberry. And that dog honestly was just like me. Blueberry was, was very, very outgoing. He had a big personality, but Blueberry did shed a lot. 
and since he was a keys hound, it's kind of like imagine a Pomeranian, but like 10 times the size. So he was about a 35 to 40 pound dog, but with blueberry, the amount of brushing that you had to do for him was very, very tedious. And he, there were like little puff balls of fur that he, he would leave me behind. And I didn't know if I wanted to deal with little <laughs> puff balls of fur. So that's why I opted with the golden doodle. Like, and so in college, you were involved with student government? Yes. So like when I was in college, I was actually president of my university, right? And I got, when I tell people, like when they're search, searching for a job, like you never know what someone has, right? They're biased, right? So like me, when I work for somebody, I'm looking for like, hire people. They have student government always like give an extra nudge, right? Or, like put on the top of the thing, right? Of course, no one would ever know that, right? No, no, nobody has really known that about me. And for student government too, because I had so many various leadership positions at the Cal Maritime Academy, I had a small, but the role did make a good amount of impact. So I was an event coordinator. And what my role was there is I would bring people together based off of different events. And it was really, really nice because I got to interact with all different grade levels, all people of different ages, different majors, people in different walks of life, which I really appreciated. I think my favorite event as a event coordinator with student government is um, we were going to see Hamilton at 7 p.m. in San Francisco. And if you know the Bay Area traffic, like trying to get in and out of the city, especially on a Friday evening was 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 not fun. So I um, I personally don't really like to drive a big van and it was a 15 passenger van. So what I would do is I'd hire my friends to drive the van for me. So that way I could worry about the other event logistics rather than having to drive and worry about the event logistics. So it was four, it was like 5.30 and it was rush hour. And my friends and I were trying to get in downtown San Francisco for Hamilton. And I remember we were on the Bay Bridge, like getting ready to pay for the toll, getting into San Francisco. And me and my friends in a big 15 passenger van, we just cut so many people off. And we knew we could get away yeah. with that because it's like, who's going to mess with a big 15 passenger van? We made it, but honestly, driving in San Francisco during rush hour on a Friday evening was like one of the most stressful events that I, I did while I was Yeah, I'm the first person to San Francisco to visit my niece. She lives in the area. And I learned you have to pity on the city. It, it totally blew my mind, right? Like, are you kidding me? You got to pay to go in the city? And on top of that, it's like through this traffic, you got to pay? It yes. made no sense to me. You, yeah. And we because Cal Maritime was in Vallejo, so there was a little bit north, we had to pay twice. So we'd have to pay going into San Francisco. And then because we were on the other side of the Carquinez Bridge, that was also another toll that we had to pay on the way back. So what's something you did while you're still in government that you're really proud of? that is actually like affecting students today. Yeah, I will say the camaraderie that I was able to build while I was an event coordinator with all different types of majors and with all different grades levels, I think is something that people realize that is still important today. Because when you are a cadet at the California Maritime Academy, it's very, very different from a traditional university, right? Like you have to wear a very lovely khaki uniform, which is crazy to some people because, you know, it's not like you can roll out of bed and put your sweats on and run down the stairs to class. In addition to the uniform, you would have to get up three times a week and be downstairs at the quad for something called formation. And if you were late, you know, because it, there was the academy aspect, you would get in trouble for that. And in addition to the uniform, the getting up early, Cal Maritime was also very, very strict. So there was a good amount of things that you could and couldn't do. As an example, since I was a woman attending the academy, I would have to have my hair in a certain way, which is a military type bun. Um, my nails couldn't be any color that I wanted. It had to be a color that was flattering to my skin tone or some girls like I did, we just kind of wore like French manicures. So that way it was something traditional, you know, that like not very many 
uh, commandants, which is the officers that were kind of a, the group in charge of cadets would get in trouble or you would get in trouble for it. So I really, really think the community aspect of the academy is super, super important and that it carries to this day because when you're a cadet, there's just so many different responsibilities and there's a different stress level compared to the average college. So just being able to get your group of friends and then be able to make different types of friends and have you all bond for something that's fun is super, super important. And while I've been, I've been out of the academy for a little bit, it's really, really nice to see the community aspect at Cal Maritime still carry. I still have friends that go to the academy as well. And I still have um, teachers and faculty members that I worked for that I'm so close with too. So again, just being able to bring people together, have fun at an event, not eat dorm food, right? Because everyone loves Cal Maritime or just college dorm food in general and just have a great time and be yourself and express individuality is something that's super important. So is this something like the you know, Virginia Military Institute, the Citadel, like along those types of colleges? Yes, it's very similar. So what makes Cal Maritime different? And when you graduate, you get like a commission in the military or something? You can. Um, if you decide to pick that route, you can commission. I did not commission because I wasn't sure if the military track was what I truly wanted, but I do have friends that went through ROTC programs, or if they didn't do ROTC, there is another Marine program. There is the Coast Guard Auxiliary program. So it really just depends. Or for the maritime industry specifically, we had something that was called Strategic Sea Lift Program where cadets in the either deck major, which is you learn how to operate and drive a ship, and then the engineering department where you learn how to either fix something or build components together in order to make something work. You could do the strategic sea lift program, and then after that, you would commission as a merchant marine officer. But again, that that was not the route that I wanted to yeah, go. Um, I, I, so... Does anyone uh, get a, the scholarships at school? You have to pay for the school? So there's a little bit of both. Some of my friends did get like ROTC or other, some forms of scholarships. Um, I was able to get the Western Undergraduate Exchange Scholarship or RUI. So it actually was cheaper for me to go to California rather than to stay in state. Because if you are a recipient of the Western undergraduate or the WUI scholarship, your tuition is only 1.5% higher than the in-state tuition for a California resident. So if you are an undergraduate student or if you're somebody that's looking to go back to school, I highly recommend looking into the Western undergraduate scholarship because I believe it applies to Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Utah, and some schools in Hawaii. So it's a it's a really good scholarship that I would not recommend passing up at all. But how many people go to school there? Like an estimate? I would have to say around a thousand students go there. Okay, it's a pretty small school. Yes, it's a it's a pretty small school and it's known as being one of the best kept secrets on the West Coast because if you're not looking for maritime education or if you don't know, you know, then how are you supposed to find out? And when did you do your graduate? What year? I graduated in 2020. So pretty fairly so, recently. So what are some advantages or disadvantages going to a school so small? Yeah. So an advantage is that personally for me, math was never really something that that clicked with my brain. I would I would really, really try. And after a lot of hard work, it would come, but come some of my friends they could just look at a math problem and be like, okay, here's the answer. I am one of those people that's very, very detailed and analytical. So I would be that person that shows every step, like how I got an answer and here is the reasoning as to why I got an answer. So if you needed help, I would say that there was a good amount of opportunity to interact with the professor yourself rather than you know what I mean? Having like the teacher's aid or somebody else, you would actually get that one-on-one -on -one time with the professor. In addition to the one-on-one -on -one time with the professor, the class size was pretty small. So I got to know a lot of my classmates fairly well. 
besides me getting to know my classmates fairly well, I also loved that the faculty got to know me fairly well. And um, I got to build really, really great connections. And in addition to the connections, um, I was able to tell my teachers like, hey, I want to work at X after graduation. And they would kind of help me get either leadership positions or they would say, hey, so-and-so has an internship open. You should go for this position. I think a negative or and personally, sometimes since I, I did do a lot of extracurricular activities at the academy, um, not having to walk very far <laughs> was, was nice. Um, a disadvantage of a small school, you know, is that it is small. And sometimes because of the location at, of Cal Maritime in Vallejo, we would kind of have to go out of our way to like get to San Francisco or get to Walnut Creek. And again, because we were on the other side of the Carquinez Bridge, if we wanted to go do something fun, it was it was another toll. Um, I will say to you know, small schools sometimes there's a little bit of drama, and if if somebody finds something out, usually everybody finds everything out, but. I don't regret going to a small school because I feel like I've I've gone to small schools usually. So I just really enjoyed having the genuine time with my professors, in addition to having the professors as well, just really, really getting that one-on-one -on -one help, especially with math. Like I remember sitting in my statistics um, professor's office trying to figure out to get help or if it wasn't my statistics teacher that could help me because Cal since Cal Maritime was small, you know, another disadvantage I would say is sometimes classes were only offered like certain semesters. So if you didn't take a class this semester, then it would kind of set you back, you know, because sometimes classes would be a building block or a prerequisite. So if you didn't take one class, then you couldn't get into your other classes. Um, and I waited to take statistics because I was trying to avoid it as much as I could. Yes. But then when I was trying to register for classes, because, you know, the university struggles of whenever your window opens to register for classes, of course, everyone's up trying to find like the best place to either get normal cell service or Wi-Fi me getting denied for classes because I didn't take stats was lovely to deal with. And then because I didn't take stats, I'd have to go beg to my department chair and be like, please let me take this class. And then um, I got lucky. The, the class that I didn't have was statistics and I needed it to take financial management and a capstone class. And I was like, please, please let me take it. Like I'm in the class right now. I promise I can handle it. And luckily again, because Cal Maritime was a small school, the professors knew me and they just signed the yeah, little I'm waiver. Sure the fact you were still a governor, you were a nice person. <laughs> I was, I was, I was pretty, I was pretty known, but that's because in addition to student government, I also worked for the housing department at Cal Maritime. I worked at finance too. So if people had questions. So what I'm hearing is you spent like two hours a day while you're in college. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty accurate. I would say uh, sleep is for the week. And then um, I also worked for the basketball team too. So if the ladies were on the road, I was on the road with them. If the girls had practice, I would have practice. Often, sometimes the practice would be really, really late at night because we'd have to share a gym with the men's team. So we had kind of alternate like Mondays and Wednesdays, we would have um, early and then Tuesday, Thursday, we'd have late or coach should be like, psych, we're practicing at 6am. So we were up at the gym at like 530 and going to practice at like 630 in the morning, which is great. So quick question. I'll make this kind of right. So I think since the seventies, the cost of education has gone up by 10,000%. People actually getting jobs are going way down. Right. As a recent graduate, from your point of view, what is the purpose of college? Right. Is it help you find a job? Is it teach you how to think? And what should be the role of college from your point of view? Yeah, I think college for me, um, 
I grew up in a Filipino household. So my mom always, always, always is instilled the value of education and higher learning and to push yourself. So I really do think that college is to designed to help you learn about something. However, I don't think it's necessary, especially if you, if it's not for you, because some of my friends, you know, they decided like college isn't for me and I'm going to pursue a trade and seeing that they, Jason, they don't have student debt, which is something that's very, very prominent in society, especially for young people trying to get a college education with how expensive everything has gotten and seeing how much money my friends have made that have pursued trades. I'm just, sometimes I'm like, did I make the wrong move by, by going to college? Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't, I don't regret going to college, but, um, in society, I kind of wish that the trade industry would be more promoted because sometimes I just feel like it's not, especially, you know, in the maritime industry too, like there are so many different trades that you could pursue that's transferable in and out of the maritime industry. And if college isn't for you, but if you want to learn a skill, I'd highly recommend yeah, that. I people. never think we had decided that step a long time ago where I remember back in the day, like go to college, don't do a trade, you know, you don't want to work longer, hard hours, you know, blah, 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 you know, get a whatever degree, right? Now you got people getting degrees in, I don't know. And that's wrong that I think if I get a degree in women's literature or, you know, or, or ethnic studies or philosophy or liberal arts, you know, and people still find jobs with that stuff, but man, it's a whole lot harder to find a job with like a degree like that. And you have like, and then because you'll go to like, a, what's that school out of Eastern Washington, Whitman College? It's like a real liberal arts school, real expensive, you know? I, I think that, I think so. So you, My... get, so you get a degree in liberal arts, 100,000 degrees, you got to pay back and you like, and then you got someone like, learn how to be a plumber, making six figures, you know? Like, and don't get me wrong, being a plumber is not easy work, right? It's hard work, right? Like being a lineman or it's hard work, right? But they get paid good money, right? Yes, or being an electrician. Some of my, or a cousin of mine actually is an electrician and he makes pretty pretty decent money without a college education. I mean, so. like you have a house and your, your, your pipe breaks, right? And the plumber says 50 bucks, what are you gonna say? I'm only gonna pay you 25. Like, no, you have to pay the price. You don't pay what tell you, right? Exactly. Or if electrician, especially with the older properties, if an electrician says, Hey, your electricity panel is old and you need to fix it, you're gonna have to pay whatever the hourly rate is. Yeah. And all the stats show like all these trades are like like growth behind like they need they like they hire like ten thousand people to do this. They also have all this price supervisor leaving, you know, just I mean, AI can do everything, right? Like, right. AI can do everything. Right. I, I don't think that AI can do everything. And there are those those skill sets, such as being an electrician, plumber, where you really need that hands-on talent to, to fix something. That personally was not for me. I mean, Jason, I I knew engineering wasn't for me. Like if I, I figured if I couldn't build a Lego set, then I'm not yeah, going to be able to. Yeah, you sound like me. I'm not like all the stuff in here. I, I'd pay someone on tap to put all the stuff together for me, right? Me too. Yeah, Tim, me I'm, too. I'm not, make, I'm not mechanically or engineering client at that day, right? That's me as well. And especially attending the maritime school to where there was like some of my friends were technically, if something was explained to them, they could just be like, oh, okay. And then start getting to work. I'd just be, you know, that one person just sitting there and I'd be like, so who wants to help me <laughs> try to build this or try to put this together? Cause I was like, I am lost. Exactly. So most of the US military academies, uh, uh, Virginia Military Institute, uh, Siddle, all these military academies are, are, are like very, very high male dominant, right? 99% attendance. Was your school the same way? Like like 90% of more males and like 10% less female? Yes. The ratio when I attended Cal Maritime was 89 male, 11% women. And then the statistic for being a woman and a minority was even less. I think maybe around 5% or less. And how were you able to navigate that? Yeah. So I knew that I always wanted the maritime industry, the Navy or something, because I grew up in a paramilitary program called the United States Naval Sea Cadets. It's kind of like Sea Scouts or Boy Scouts, I says in a sense, but instead of being ran by the Boy Scout organization or the Girl Scout organization or something like that, it's ran under the Department of the Navy, which was cool. So the Navy actually funds the Sea Cadet program. And 
I did make the highest rank that you can make, which is a chief petty officer, which is equivalent to an E7 in the actual Navy or in the Boy Scouts, they have an Eagle Scout, which is like the highest that you can make. I did make chief. And in the sea cadets, there were women in the program, but it was still heavily male dominated. And because that program kind of taught me the building blocks that I needed in order to go to something like the academy, I think by the time that it was time for me to enter into Cal Maritime, I was already used to being, you know, sometimes like one of the only few girls in the room. And then because I was a chief too, at least at the time when I was in the program, there were other women that were chiefs, but there weren't very many women and minorities that were chief petty officers. And I think the statistic at the time when I was in the sea cadet program is that only a hundred cadets in the year nationwide get the the rank because there's there's steps that you have to go through kind of like a job promotion like when i made chief petty officer they made me um do some of the stuff that was similar in the navy to like what an actual chief petty officer does i had to build a vessel which is pretty much this wooden box and then inside the wooden box you get a record or a log book and what you're supposed to do when you're chief select is you're supposed to go around and ask chiefs to write you advice on how to be successful when you are a chief because a lot of the time especially in the sea cadets the chiefs are in charge of the unit like you are the liaison between the officers and the cadets and that was me in a sense i was the liaison between the officers and the cadets so if the cadets didn't do something right guess guess who would be um guess who would have to do the explaining it would be me and then by the time i transitioned into the academy the c cadet program set me up so much that when you know for the kids that did not know what they were getting into you know there's an element of keeping your uniform clean and shining your shoes and learning how to do military facing movements and how to do your yeah, hair. Mom was not there to do it for you, right? Right, right. And then I was, I was bored, like during my orientation week, because I already had all those skill sets from the C Cadet program, I was bored. So you, you have a lot of drive, right? And you're really, really driven. You put a lot of stuff in your plate. Why is it, and this is my opinion, why is it so people have drive nowadays and so many people don't have drive? Like, what, what is this like genetics? You know, someone motivated you had to drive? Like, why do you have drive and so many other people do not have drive? Yeah, I think I was fortunate enough to, well, I had really, really good mentors in my life that would push me to, you know, always like if somebody told you to give a hundred percent, my mentors were like, no, you're not giving a a hundred percent is enough. You're giving 110 or 120 percent to, to do whatever you do. And I think, um, one part of Maritime Blue, in addition to the promoting the new innovation and technology is another component is in the summers, we have a program called the Youth Maritime Accelerator Project, and we help youth anywhere from the ages of 18 through 24 get their foot in a maritime and um some students or youth nowadays they might not have access to the to the mentorship that that i have or you know the home life might not be might not be the best um as an example i have some family members you know that weren't given the same opportunities as me, but yet they had, they had to work hard to get what they have. And I just think that if, um, a lot of the younger generations pursued the programs that I did, they would be even in a better place where they are now. So I think the main reason why I have drive is one, definitely two, you know, my parents were minorities and from a very, very young age, my mom and my dad always instilled that because I was a woman and I was going to be, or, and I'm a woman of color. Um, if somebody was, if somebody was giving a hundred percent, you know, I would have to, I would have to even 
put in more effort to put my name out there and to show that minorities too deserve an opportunity at the table. So I think overall, just getting our youth exposed to programs like the maritime program, or if the maritime program might not be for them. I just appreciate like my nephew, for example, he's um, in fourth grade. And I really appreciate that they're already starting to have like coding opportunities for the kids and they still keep the art programs in schools. And I think just getting our youth exposed to different things rather than just having them, you know, like watch TikToks or rely on social medias because, you know, kids, the universe of TikTok. Yes. <laughs> the ki kids will pick up on what they see. And as an example, if the student is really in the sports, they'll be like, oh, I want to be a professional athlete. But if we just expose our youth to more youth programs or different skills of interest, I think that's where the drive and the motivation will come I know from. If you're a school, I don't care if you're elementary, junior high, high, high school, if you're not offering coding classes, like what are you even doing right? Like, they, I mean, coding, it has to be, they, they want to learn coding as a second language. Right. And I personally felt that at, um, I don't know what it's like now, again, because I graduated at Cal Mayor time, but I feel like they started having us code a little too late. In my opinion, they didn't have us start coding until junior and senior year, at least, right. At least in my experience. And it was tough because, you know, Cal Maritime, again, being a small school, um, my favorite professor, Dr. Joshua Shackman, he would have to do his best because some students that were younger than me were like, oh, our studio, I already know how to do our studio. But for someone like me that's coming in scr from scratch, our studio, which is a pretty much a coding, it's coding, but for statistics, that's the best way that my brain can describe it. So for folks that are a lot more coding experienced than I am, I apologize if I did not describe our studio, right? But, you know, it was I really appreciated what would happen once the coding would work for me. But if I got error messages, Jason, I can't, I can't count how many times that on my exam for that, that coding class, I would just be like, look, this is the line of code that I had. It had error messages. <laughs> Normally, you know, this is what would happen if, but I do appreciate too that. Dr. Shackman was really patient. And if he was like, if you get lost, just explain what you would do on a separate work document. So just in case if your code doesn't work, if our studio decides to, you know, like act up or something on you, then he was like, just at least explain the steps. And I would explain the steps because again, me being <laughs> very, very <laughs> analytical and detailed, um, I'm a Virgo if, if, which explains a lot too, to some people, because usually September Virgos are very, very analytical. They're very, very detailed. Um, September 20th. Yeah, my daughter is two more September 6th. It explains a lot, right? <laughs> but I mean, people say those astrology signs are bullshit, but well, there's a lot of truth to them, right? Yeah, there, there is, I mean, there is a lot of truth to them. There's too many coincidences, right? For it to be totally wrong. Like too many people are born like on a certain date act the same or think the same, right? Yes, I, I personally believe in that stuff, especially with me being an earth sign. We're very, very like grounded, as people say. And then the details come to us naturally. We always look for the fine details too. So um, for whenever, for the folks that do believe in astrology, and if I just say like, I'm a Virgo and they'll be like, oh, which one? Like August or September. And I say September and they're like, oh yeah, makes complete sense as to why like, how you are. So, you know, astrology, are you into, into astronomy also? Um, somewhat, I will admit. So when I was picking my major at Cal Maritime, um, it, the engineering again was out. Everyone was trying to get me to do engineering, especially my dad. But I said, no, you know, if I can't build the Legos, that's yeah, out. Take the hint, right? right. Right. If I can't build the Legos, that's out. And then there would be like all this map and stuff that you'd have to do. Like that, I'm trying to save your money, right? Right, exactly. I'm and then, <laughs> and then at Cal Maritime too, if you were, if you were an engineer, they would want you to have already taken 
calculus because calculus was a prereq for a lot of the classes. Yeah, I know a lot of space stuff. I just recently learned like like NASA people on the moon, Mars, it's like calculus is a base math that you write. Yes. And then I was like, okay, well, that would already put me a year behind because again, Cal Maritime being a small school, classes were only offered a certain amount, unless if I wanted to take calculus in the summer. But when you're 18, right, and you're entering, yeah, I was like, no, okay. right. I was like, I don't want to take any, <laughs> I don't want to take any more math classes than I already had to. So I was, it was either between learning how to drive the ship or the deck major or international business because and the reason why international business, I was like, well, if maritime doesn't work out for me, then I can have a degree, you know, that's more transferable. So I could go to Amazon, I could go to a tech company and say, I'm an international business major. So what stopped me, fun fact, from pursuing um, the deck major is one, I personally, the ocean kind of freaks me out. Like I know it's in it. I know it. what hasn't been explored. So that part freaks me out. Um, and two, I found out that if your navigation system breaks, Sounds good and scary. you have to do celestial navigation, which is a lot of trigonometry or pre-calc, and you have to navigate by the stars to know where you're going. And after, like, like you're back in the yeah, yeah. And after that, I said, nope, I am not navigating by the stars. Like that sounds like a lot of trigonometry. And then how do you navigate by the stars and the tiles are right? I honestly have no idea. Like you my like stop there to like cloud leave or something. I have no clue. Like my friends would pull out sextants and try to navigate where things were, and they'd be like, "Okay, like the north, the north stars here, the big dippers here." And I said, "No, thank you." I was like, "You will not catch me <laughs> navigating by the stars because it is it is tri a lot of it is trigonometry because you you know you have to pick like okay if you're trying to go here and if the angle is there." And I just said, "Pull the plug." I said. I'm picking business. I said, I'm not doing this. So well, either you or your parents born in the Philippines, you're all born in the United States. So my dad was born, actually, I, I'm blanking at the moment where, but he grew up in a military family. So he was, he was born somewhere um, overseas, I believe. But my mom was born in the Philippines and then she did immigrate here. So basically you're like a second generation immigrant? Yes. Generation. Mm hmm so how have you found that to be a band or disadvantage? You competed against, like, I would say, regular Americans have been all the life, all the bands or whatever to go on. You're like, you know. Yeah, I will say a, an advantage is, is that being a minority, I really definitely can own who I am. Um, you know, my last name gives me away, of course, and, and that's a, a pro and a con because sometimes, unfortunately, when you are applying for jobs, even if they look at a name and if they see that you are a minority, you can get tossed out. Yeah, I think they'll say done like, you know, if someone's name is like, you know, Mary versus, you know, a more ethnic name or, you know, John versus Simone, whatever it could be, right? Like, yeah. Right. And then for, but I will say, I do appreciate that there are a lot of DEI efforts and initiatives. Um, as an example to one of our startups that went through our program called Sea Potential, they really, really foster getting minorities into maritime, which is kind of an, an uncommon factor. So I do appreciate that there are a lot of initiatives out there and job descriptions too, I found looking It'll say like um, BIPOC people or minorities, women are highly encouraged to apply. And if, you know, you are, um, even if you don't fit into all these qualifications, but you're interested, like, please go ahead and apply anyway. You know, we'd love to speak with you. Um, a lot of networking events too. We went to South by Southwest recently, and there was an event that was specifically for women in tech. And it was so lovely to see people that not only looked like me in the room, but facing with some of the same problems that I've encountered. Um, a negative I would have to say is some folks don't really have experiences with different cultures. And um, with me being both African-American and Filipino, I have had that, especially too, since I've been fortunate to travel to different places. Some people have not. So, you know, there could be a cultural understanding that some employers might not face. Or in addition to that too, you know, there's certain holidays that Filipinos celebrate, which sometimes society does not. 
and things like that. Um, I will say to, you know, some, some people haven't been understanding anything from food choices that people would want to make to just overall, like cultural things, because for me being Filipino, Jason, I'm sure you know this because you've attended some of our networking events before. One of the things that the Filipino culture really, really embraces is food and bringing people together. So that's why if anyone attends any one of my events, there's a lot of food and there's usually enough food for people to take home. But that's the Filipino in me coming out, you know, making sure that if guests take the time to come to one of the events that whether if it's me leading it or Maritime Blue as an organization host, that people feel welcome. Because at the end of the day, I understand, you know, people have jobs, some people have families or other family members that they have to take care of if it's not necessarily a significant other and kids. And it is a sacrifice of someone's time. So whatever I can do to make someone feel welcome at something that we're hosting, you know, to me, it means a lot to somebody else. But again, from the outside looking in, somebody else might not understand that because it's the Filipino in me coming out. And especially too, with inflation layoffs and things like that, I do understand that feud insecurity is a thing and not very many people want to admit to that, unfortunately, because, you know, society kind of looks down on people if you experience food so, insecurity. This might be a slight exaggeration, but my first job when I tried the Army, I, I did HR for a seafood company up in, up in Alaska, right? And most of the seafood workers are really pinned, right? And I swear to God, they accept the Christmas tree on July 5th. Like, July 5th, maybe like August, the Christmas tree is up, decorations. I'm like, what the going on? Like, and someone was stupid enough to say, we need to take that down. Oh my God. Talk about a revolt. The Filipinos was like, we are not taking the street down. We were all quick. So like, yeah. Yeah. See, there, there's definitely a a lack, you know, again, of, of a culture understanding there. And again, um, I was so thankful that being an international business major, one of the things that both my favorite professor, Dr. Shackman, and then another professor, um, Professor Newman would do is that they would pull out this book with all these different cultural norms. And they would say, okay, you know, if you accept a business card, for example, from someone in Japan, you're supposed to accept it with two hands and your hands are supposed to face a certain way rather than just the average you know, if you, yeah, and I think, I think Korea is like put the money on the counter and they, they'll put it into your hand because it's not a disrespect. And then I saw this at the University of TikTok, right? A couple of days ago. So this guy, Kenny Smith, talked about how he played for Dean Smith, the coach that was a really good guy. He told a story and had a, they had a player on the team from, um, I think from Angola, right? And the coach, Dean Smith, talked to the guy, right? Hey, look at my face, you know, you disagree. And if no coach in my culture, that's the sort of, if I look at you, I'm disrespecting you, right? So Coach Smith sent his system to his hometown to learn the culture, right? And like, man, like, who does that, right? Right. Well, and even for me too, it's still a learning because we had a delegation from Finland come visit us. And I, Jason, I had no idea that Finlands are not small talkers or the Finnish are not small talkers. So I learned the hard way because here I am, you know, trying to, we had an event down in Tacoma and it was significant to me because the fact that people were coming to where I grew up, especially by the port means a lot. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty long trip. Right. But here I am trying to make small talk with them and they just wouldn't do it. And I didn't understand, but. You think they're being rude. Right, right. right. But then going back, um, I actually went to another Finnish event and there was a, a, pa a pamphlet about Finland and about Finnish people and what they're like. A uh, fun fact, I actually did learn recently that Finland is like the happiest country yeah. <laughs> in the world, oh, right. which I, I definitely see wh why after we had um, two Finnish companies in our one ocean accelerator. But on the little pamphlet, it said, Finnish people are not small talkers, but when we talk, we mean what we say, and it usually has significance. And I was like, where, and I was teasing with um, Maritime Blue CEO and my boss. And I said, where was this card when I was trying to <laughs> make small talk with them a year ago? And then another thing too, is usually at networking events, if there's a meal served or some type of food, people will go and they'll socialize, but again, Finnish people do not eat or like do not talk when they eat. Like they just eat and they 
they get the job done. So, you know, again, here I, again, it was a cultural misunderstanding on my part. And I, I think a lesson, a learning lesson for me there is that whenever we have international delegations, I'm definitely right. I'm going to take my, my professor's advice and, and look up, you know, anything from giving a gift because I have learned too, especially during my capstone class senior year that some countries, you know, would prefer more of an elaborate gift while other ones would prefer more of an inexpensive gift. So everything from gift giving to business card acceptance to handshake norms. Yes. And I really, really encourage people to, to do the same. How often do you or your family go back to the Philippines and visit? So the last time that I personally went was in 2017. So it, it's been a little bit. Um, my mom recently went in 2018. So it kind of just depends. We try to make it around every five, six years, but sometimes, you know, life I mean, it just... is like a 47 hour flight, right? Or something crazy like that. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. So usually what happens, um, and again, I would, I would joke about this because the, me driving from Tacoma to Vallejo was about 11, 12, 13 hours, depending on the traffic. So the flight to the Philippines is usually 13. The first leg is 13. So you either fly to, and this is my experience. Some people could have completely different experiences, but sometimes we've flown to South Korea first and then done uh, flew from South Korea to the Philippines. And then the flight from South Korea to the Philippines is about from Seattle to Southern California. So about three hours, or we did, um, we did Seattle to Japan and then Japan to the Philippines. Sometimes you can fly from Seattle to China and then go from China to the Philippines. So it really, just depends. I would say the airline that you're taking to, we've taken Asiana, which is more of a Korean based airline. And then we've taken Ana or ANA, and that's more of a Japan based airline. And what I do appreciate is that they usually serve you, at least in my experience, Asiana would serve you more like Korean type of food. And then Japan would serve you like more Japanese style food, which was pretty cool to experience on an international flight. So totally my question. Is there a certain type of Filipino food that you like to cook the best? Um, or, well, you, or, you, or you like the best? Well, lu lumpia, of lumpia. course, yeah. is is a given. That's like that. I'm part of it's not like the rice of the Filipino culture, like the basic staple. Yeah, it's a basic staple. And if you have never had a lumpia before, just put it out. You're missing out. And it's, it's pretty much an egg. It's, <laughs> it's pretty much an egg roll. That's how I describe it for for someone that's like never had it before is is an egg roll and then I recently became more like vegetarian slash pescatarian so I've had to cut a lot of Filipino food out which is sad or I find plant-based options yeah. for it we had a we had some a Filipino friends one of this group me and my friend were for three years and it's Filipino friend of us he, he did like you know how they do the, the take rolls on the ground oh man that was so good like that was so good you want some lechon, Jason? Is oh, that yes. what you're saying? <laughs> yes, I am saying that. Yes. I can recommend a few good spots around okay. here if you're yeah. if you're interested. Yeah. Um, so in college, like you like you said, it's eighty nine percent male, eighty nine percent female. How were we able to take that experience and we learn from that to what you're doing now, right? Because you know, text is known for like it being heavy male, heavy white male, few females. How have you taken that experience in college that can make it for you and and do better than the army and take of army now more which of course knows about like being brat boyish all that kind of stuff unfortunately yeah i will say so definitely being an academy graduate and um being in maritime technology i will say you i am genuinely myself and i feel like that's what really really makes me stand out because what i've noticed is sometimes you know if you're with a certain group of people, or if you're with somebody that's very, very influential, people will try to emulate or act like the folks that are, you know, very, very influential. But for me, I've just learned one to really, really be myself and to express my own individuality, me expressing who I am, 
has really, really helped me out. Like people know, you know, that I'm usually very, very outgoing. I'm very friendly. I like to welcome people with food events or something that I really, really love doing, which sometimes people don't like, you know, going through the trouble of hosting an event because there's so many steps to it that people don't realize. So I think me being myself is one aspect that really, really has helped me. And especially since both the academy and the maritime technology sector that I've been in has been very, very male dominated, but also too, a sense of vulnerability has really, really helped my case out in a lot because, you know, since I've graduated from the academy very, very recently, there are people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. And sometimes they'll try to people will try to test to see, you know, like what my knowledge is or what my skill set could be. So just being able to get together with, and especially in Tacoma too, like with the community that we're building in Tacoma, just being able to get together with folks from like the Economic Development Board of Pierce County, the Port of Tacoma, the city of Tacoma, just being able to get together with a strong group of women and say like, hey, this is this is what I'm personally struggling with. Like if you were in my situation, what, how would you handle this or what would you do? Um, a very, very good mentor of mine, and I'm going to call her out. So Claire, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize in advance, but Claire Petrich, um, Claire has broken through so many barriers because not only was she a woman in the 80s in the maritime industry, but she was also the very first woman elected to the Port Commission, which, you know, that's not usually a commonality until recently to have women be on the Port Commission. And what I really, really appreciated about Claire is Claire pretty much said, you know, Karina, I hear you. I've, I've seen it because Claire has gotten to live in several different countries for a little bit, including India. And she said she got to see a little bit of what the Indian culture was like. And she also let us know recently that she worked in the prison, prison system. And she said, if you want to take a look, a good reflection of what your society is like, look at your prison systems. But Claire has really, really pushed me these past few years to think outside of the box. And then in addition to the different mindset of thinking, Pat Beard from the city of Tacoma, Pat has really, really helped and really, really helped me like get over my imposter syndrome, um, which is very, very common especially being for me being so young in the yeah, tech i think people realize everyone has a positive syndrome everyone like like you talk to very sexual people and like i don't know what i'm doing and like you're, you're like you're like the superstar what do you mean imposter syndrome uh, everyone has imposter syndrome right yeah that is exactly how i feel because my predecessor who helped start the incubator they were well-known in Tacoma. They were an investor. In addition to them being well-known, they also had a lot more connections than I, I did when I took the job over. So when I, when the recommendation was made that I take the Tacoma program over, I was like, that's, that's some big shoes to fill, you know, because my predecessor was dealing with very, very important people, whether they were maritime related or not. Um, some of the folks that he had interactions with were folks in the city or like the city level government, and then the representatives in the area. And he would just say that he knew all these people, all these investors. And a part of me last year, Jason, if we would have done this a year ago, I would have just told you, like, I don't know how I can, I can live up to this. I mean, someone saw something in you, right? You know, it's often the time people see stuff in yourself that we don't see in ourselves, right? I agree. I agree. And especially with the entrepreneurs that go through our programs too, especially me building or building the Tacoma program out even further than where it was already. I was so, I am so close to the work that I'm doing. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. And sometimes it's hard for me to pay attention to it. Right. Because the minute that you build something out here, I, sometimes it feels like that I have to 360 and go meet someone else or go work on someone else or go do all these 
different components. But when you are so close to the work, just like being an entrepreneur, you, when you are so close to the work and when you're building something out, you just don't see it right away. And I, def that was definitely was me like building this Tacoma program out. Everyone's like, Oh my goodness. Like you're doing such a wonderful job. Like look at where the program, you know, started and look at where it is now. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, yeah, I have yeah, some work so to right, do. Right. I see a lot of like, we're, we're in the tree so much, right? Are you something you got to go back six months of time? Like, oh, wow, I have done something in six months. I, I you know, you, you know, day to day, you're doing stuff, you don't see like, like vision, but you go back in time. Oh, I was here six months ago, now I'm way over here. Yeah, I, I 100% agree because even if we look back a year from now, with the Tacoma program, it we still had our first cohort. We were starting to graduate companies out. And then fast forward to a year, I just can't believe that we already graduated the first cohort out. We have a second cohort. The second cohort's already about 50% complete too, which is crazy. And then they're going to graduate from the Tacoma program come November. So it's like, I just, I just can't believe how much has happened, but at the same time, it's it's hard for me so to. We're definitely gonna do a deep dive on that program in a minute. First, I want to say this: What advice you have? Not only like someone to be the only woman in the room, but what advice you have for someone who's the only only what only X in the room, right? The only white person, the only black person, the only whatever the case be. What's your advice to someone who's only that in the room? Yeah, I would definitely have to say one: be yourself, be very very genuine, and then if. You know, if somebody doesn't agree with what you have to say, there are very, there are ways to let people know respectfully. And two, I've been really pushing myself to wear bright color, bright colors and bright outfits. So make sure you have the outfit of choice that will make you feel super, super confident as well as the shoes of choice. Um, for me, the joke is in our little maritime community that we like to wear, um, suits and air force ones so i definitely have a suit and some some white air force ones on so the it's, it's called the washington maritime academy correct um the college or no, the, the what are you working at right now? uh washington maritime blue how long has that been going on it's, it's pretty new pretty, a pretty new program right yeah, Washington Maritime Blue as an organization is still fairly new so the organization was around in 2018 and with the first contract employee and i know people folks didn't start getting hired on i believe until like late 2019 2020 era so the organization itself is about five years old and then the incubator or the tacoma maritime innovation incubator what i oversee is only about it'll be three years old around the time that I started with Maritime Blue, so in December. So it's still a fairly new program. And so what's the purpose of the program? Yeah, so because I'm from Tacoma, right away, it's kind of hard to ignore that Mar there that Tacoma is a maritime city, right? Because you see the big ships pulling in and out all the time, in addition to the big ships pulling out with the FOSS waterway, how folks would come because of the railroad system and the longshoremen too. I believe the longshoremen made footprints in Tacoma around, I would have to say the early 1900s, which seems like so long ago, but if you think about it, it really wasn't. Time. Right. It wasn't that long ago. So what we really, really want to do is that the predecessor or my predecessor and Pat Beard from City of Tacoma, they realized that, you know, Tacoma is a maritime city, but there wasn't a program that was helping entrepreneurs build and scale their business in Tacoma in, in addition to building and scaling their business specifically within the maritime industry. So overall, what we really want to do in Tacoma is one, bring people to Tacoma because Jason, I know we're in Seattle and forgive me for saying this stuff, but Tacoma, you know, the rent is much cheaper compared to Seattle. In addition to what I personally felt do, too doing this role for about two years is that the Tacoma tech community will really, really accept and welcome people where sometimes in the bigger cities where the tech community is much more established, sometimes that that can be hard to find. So we really, really want to build a community in Tacoma that fosters entrepreneurs, regardless of who you are, what you identify as, help create those high wage and high paying jobs. 
and um, bring people to Tacoma to build and scale their business out and making Tacoma, you know, to the city of Tacoma and the maritime community thrive even more than it already is. So define maritime, like if we're a startup, you have to have like a boating company, like how, like how far away can they be from what maritime to apply if we need to do? Yeah, so I would pretty much have to say anything and everything that has to do with the ocean. So whether you are a fisherman with a boat, um, Aquaga, for example, they do more environmental remediation since they are trying to clean the forever chemicals that are in the environment and in the water. So if you, I would just say, if you think that there's a connection, I have a very open door policy. Folks can come talk to me and then see. Um, some people are working on more sustainability aspects. Other people are working on more climate change related to aspects. And then some folks too, what I really appreciate is that they're working on the maritime education component, because again, people don't know what they don't know. And especially for being a woman and a woman of color, if you don't see other people that look like you in the industry, you know, why would you want to pursue something? And companies like Sea Potential, companies like Innovate Social, what they do really, really well is that um, Innovate Social has children's books. And when the CEO, she showed me her children's book, she didn't think that she fit into the incubator at all. And I said, no, no, you do. Because I said, teaching kids about the importance of a clean environment and the clean water is so, so important because it's, it's part of the environment. It's part of our lives. And if you don't captivate a group of kids at a young age like that, you know, one, how are they supposed to know that there is potential for them? And two, if they don't get the exposure, they might not see themselves in the maritime industry. When you say water, you mean oceans, lakes, rivers, mm -hmm. small pond in your backyard, water. Yes. For, for me personally, yes. If there is some sort of connection to the water, um, I'm pretty easy to find. My, my last name's pretty unique. So folks can find me on LinkedIn or the Maritime Blue website and they can they can ask and we've so the people well first of all how do people find out about the maritime you have, you have like a marketing program or you reach out to people or it's like word of mouth yeah so it, right now it's a little bit of word of mouth events and again what i really appreciate about the ecosystem the tech and, 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 I'm sorry don't you but you have people from all across the country right across the world in the incubator right yes so we actually have had our first international company from france this year and how that happened is we had a french delegation come visit us last april actually and the first day they came to our seattle office in ballard and then um, about a few days later, they came to Tacoma, and that's when my boss kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone two position or two months into the position that I am right now. He had me explain, you know, the importance of what Tacoma had to offer. We actually have a sister city too. Tacoma has a sister city in France. I don't want to try to pronounce it because I, I don't want to be wrong, but there's a connection between Tacoma and that sister city because Dale Chihuly is from Tacoma. So if you drive in Tacoma on 705, and if you see this big glass structure at the Museum of Class, Dale Chihuly made that. I believe Dale Chihuly actually sent glass pieces to our sister city and France as well, because there's a there's a connection of glass blowing there. So I explained that. And in addition to, I explained how the incubator does not take any equity or fees from a founder. What do y'all give and what do each party give? Yeah. So the, so as I mentioned, we don't take any equity or fees from a founder because especially if you are an early stage entrepreneur and if you're from an underrepresented groups, and especially starting your business out, right? You want to do whatever you can to keep as much equity as you can if you are trying to go that route. Some of the companies that we've had have not had any investors, whether, and sometimes that's what the company prefers, and I respect that, but we want to make sure that there's opportunity, especially for the people 
people that come from those underrepresented groups. Education, again, has been a very, very important part of my life, especially with my mom instilling the value of education. So we provide founders with the education that they need. An important piece that we really, really strive to do is founders telling their story and pitching well, because if you can do that effectively, you one, it makes writing grants. Yeah, or, yeah. but you're right. Like so many people, I know some entrepreneurs don't want to pitch, don't want to put this out on public, right? Like no one's going to buy your mess, you know, unless your last name is Zuckerberg or Musk, right? Right. Like no one knows about what you're doing, right? You got to like put yourself out there and fail, like, you know, and, and you know, get, get shit on, so to speak, right? Yes. And we really emphasize that because again, especially in the tech world and Jason, I'm sure you know this, but if you try to go to an investor and they're like, where's your traction? What's your progress? Who do you intend to hire? Or if we cut you- in the world that means anything from one customer to me and customer. <laughs> yes. Or it's like, if we did cut you the $500,000 and took this amount of equity or whatever folks are asking for, what do you plan to do with the money? Yeah. Sometimes entrepreneurs are like, by yeah, or or I didn't get that far, and I was like, um, "These are these are components that you have to think about because especially nowadays, economy recession coming, all the you know still come probably back feeling like yeah, right." And we don't want any of our founders to not you know just get the door the quote unquote the door slammed on their face or to burn bridges because just like how the maritime world and the tech world is small yeah. i for sure know that the vc slash angel pool is small one thing too, the definitely i think i of like trying to raise money too early right yes so you shoot your shot and then you're shot it you got you get blocked and then like and then you actually read it and you're later like oh i remember jason he has some this bullshit crap ass like, go. <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna take a meeting with him exactly and we don't want that we don't want that to happen so in order to get our founders ready for whether if it's VC such angel pitching or even knowing your story effectively can help you write a grant too, because um, I've written a few grants, not by myself. So nobody come contact me to write a grant for you. But even, you know, the, the grant will ask you, okay, like you want to ask for X amount of money. What, what would you do with the money? How many, underserved groups will you serve if that's an important component for the grant how will this help you know underserved communities how will this help the city that you're trying to promote and all these questions and if you don't know all that going into a grant or some type of scholarship or some type of i want to have me feel like do a grant and don't even cover the basics of the grants for a right should have a lot oh i'm sure it does too but when i uh wrote the majority of my first one I was like I'm thankful that I did it I'm thankful that I had the experience it's super important but when I just sat there and busted out this components you know like what we had to do to get that grant for Tacoma I was just looking at my it was just like I was an undergrad again yeah. Jason it seemed like there was so many research components that you have to do and we want our founders to, to be ready. So what we really do is when we have pitch practice, I've had investors from different, different sectors come and then the founder will give their pitch and then they'll get that live feedback from an investor. And some investors, you know, they let me know after the session, like, Hey, we were frank with so-and-so. And I said, as much as like, I don't, I don't want to hear that, but, but it's necessary. So in addition to the pitch practices like that, um, in order for you to tell your story effectively, one thing that I really, really did in undergrad is if how I know how to do something is I teach people, I teach people in different audiences. So I was a tutor for a little bit and for some classes, some of my friends would ask me to help them study. And the test would be if I can teach somebody effectively to do this in different audiences, then I truly know what I'm doing. So what I try to do in Tacoma specifically is try to get our founders in front of different audiences. So we've had anything from the propeller club. I've put our founders in front of high schoolers and they've had to come up with an activity. Oh man, that's genius. <laughs> Put them in front of high schoolers. Like, yeah, I like that idea. Oh, high schoolers are brutal. Like they, oh, yeah, no, they no. will tell you, they will tell you to your face if they were like, I don't understand this. 
I don't, I don't get what you're doing type of thing. So we put them in front of propeller club. We put them in front of high schoolers. So that way they can kind of teach their business in a smaller scale activity to what they're doing. Yeah. Um, in addition to the high schoolers and the investors, we have also put them in front of different audiences as well to, to tell their, to tell the, about themselves and their business. So I've had everything from two minutes and then at the very, very end of the program, this is new. And I, the reason why this is new is last year, you know, I, I took the program over. I was still trying to get the, the water underneath the bridge, <laughs> as they say, but we are going to make them live pitch in front of an audience, one to kind of help ease with nerves, two, to get them experience and three, to to really, really own and tell their story effectively, which I think is super important. Um, in addition to the storytelling, we really give our founders access to mentors. So with the Tacoma program, I have lovely folks from the city of Tacoma, Derek Kilmer's office, Port of Tacoma, and all these different stakeholders in the maritime industry and city of Tacoma to help mentor and guide them. And that way too, Jason, I'm only one person. I know that I don't know it all. And I'm glad that I can rely on the mentors from whether it's the steering committee or Maritime Blues Network as a whole to help these founders out. And like you mentioned earlier, as an entrepreneur, you have to put yourself out there because unless if your last name's Zuckerberg, Musk, or somebody that's well-known in the tech industry, such as Bezos, most likely people are not going to buy your product unless if you put yourself out there. So that's why the networking events that whether the Tacoma program hosts or Washington Maritime Blue hosts are super, super important. So that way founders can meet different types of people. Again, tell, explain what they're doing to different types of people and building a business too, a lot of it is the connections because if so-and-so, if, or if you tell us your product to somebody and if they know people in their network, just like the power of LinkedIn and sharing, it's super, super important. So my advice to not only our entrepreneurs, but as well as any entrepreneur is you have to put yourself out there and you have to be very, very genuine about it too, because sometimes, you know, when sometimes, at least in my experience, um, it kind of sounds salesy. And if it's salesy, then there's no, at least to me, it's not really, you know, there's not an aspect of genuality. So whenever I meet with a potential founder, I always ask, okay, like what made you decide to do what you're doing. Some founders are like, I realized that during my work experience, there was a problem here and that there was nobody working on it. So we wanted to fix this or other founders, you know, that I met were like, you know, I really have a passion for this. And I really wanted to take my passion and apply it to a business, which also is super important. But again, entrepreneurs cannot be afraid to put themselves out there and with me being the youngest child, no is something that I heard a lot, <laughs> which I'm sure all kids hear the word no a lot, but me being the youngest child, I would hear no a lot. So I would say, okay, well, if this parent said no, who, which parent is going to let me do? You only need one yes, right? Right, <laughs> exactly. Yes. And that's what it takes. You only need one yes, and you need a network of people to back you and to believe to believe in what you're doing, which is super important. And I don't want any entrepreneur to forget that. How do you have your people do this, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they first pitch, they're like, it's all features based, right? My product is one, two, three, right? How do you like make them like do that mind shift from just feature based, like just to tell the story, like you said? Yeah. So what we do in Maritime Blue and specifically in the incubator is if founders have expressed any type of interest or whether it's they want to be in the program to they want to learn more about the program or not just the Tacoma program, but our other programs, they'll either meet with me or my boss, which is the director of Blue Ventures. And if it's Tacoma specifically, they'll meet with me and then they'll kind of give me a little bit of their pitch. Um, 
I always liked, if a founder is interested, I always like to do it in a low stakes environment too. So that way I can really, really see what the founder is like rather than them, you know, just like coming to the office, giving me the traditional pitch type thing because they need to do that later. So what I do is I'll invite the coffee out or I'll invite the founder out for like coffee or for lunch or happy hour or something that somewhere that they can tell me what they're doing in a low stakes environment. And then if I think that there's a fit, if me and my, or, and, or my boss think that there's a fit, then we'll pass them to the next phase of the interview where they have to give a live five minute pitch, usually with the slide deck. And five minutes is a long time. It is a long time. It seems like a long time, but five minutes is a long ass time. <laughs> it is. It's, it could be long and it could be short because especially for some of our founders that are a little bit more technical, you know, they'll really get into the technical component. But then of course we get feedback from the steering committee. So what happens is, is that founders give a live five minute pitch. So what happens is there's five minutes for questions or there's five minutes for the pitch. And then there's five minutes for questions from the steering committee. After the steering committee hears all of the founders that are interested in the incubator, then they fill out a survey and then they let me know who they want to see in the program and why. And then after looking at the steering committee results, I like to look at it first to kind of get a sense of what the steering committee is feeling. And then after that, me, my boss, the director of Blue Ventures, and then the CEO of Maritime Blue will kind of look it over to see, you know, what the recommendations of the steering committee. And then after we deliberate, that's who decides, or that's the factors of getting into the incubator. So how long is the incubator? The incubator is a one-year duration. Oh, one year? Yes, it's and one year. Like, it's like, there's like program every day, program every week, or like, yeah, so we tr really try not to make it too intensive because the whole goal is to really give the founder the space to build and, and scale it. Yes, so we have six companies right now, so anywhere from five to six. And the reason why is because they're truly with us for a year. You get office space for a year, mentoring, networking. So the people that move did you pay for the flights over here or they didn't pay for themselves? They are currently looking for an employee to move to Tacoma and establish roots to be able to speak English and French and work with the, the odd time zone difference. And if somebody's got accepted, do they all make it through or they like some of them got some of them drop out or get kicked out or how that work? So we've had some um, in the between the two cohorts so far, everyone in this cohort is fine. Last year, we did have someone drop. So sometimes we've noticed throughout any of the entrepreneurship programs, and even talking with other ecosystem builders, sometimes that just happens due to unexpected circumstances. You know, maybe a founder thought that at first the program was for them, and it wasn't. And plus, life events happen. You know, like somebody might die, or like might be right, right. Somebody has a baby. Somebody gets married. Um, we've experienced, I think marriages and babies so far and so far it's been okay, but talking with the uh, other, you know, folks in the area, sometimes life just happens and I don't, I don't blame the founder. Well, maybe like, oh shit, this isn't for me. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So with the six companies, we have five companies that are accepted in the incubator cohort and then we had something new this year which is a community member so the community member is the building blocks to help you get ready to become a part of the incubator cohort but we wanted something like that because education jason is just so so important for entrepreneurs to get and sometimes if uh, and yeah, so much to learn right yes like, it's, it's, it's all right I mean, something simple like you know, learn how to set up Google Analytics, right? Or learn how to do a cold sales call, or like look look reviewing code. Like, what is GitHub? You know, like it's insane that stuff you got to know. I, I I can't imagine you got to learn this. That's probably like a maritime tech company, right? We can be like on the along with that, right? And we we really really value the educational component in addition to the educational component too. There's a there's a network in a community that we're building out, and 
with all of our entrepreneurship programs, it's kind of bittersweet when we watch them graduate because it's like we have a a community of entrepreneurs, you know, and then they graduate. And once they graduate, it doesn't mean that we won't help them if they ever need assistance, but you know, they won't be directly under and these our companies, supervision. Are they like the PC level, P revenue, PC? Like what, what level are they usually at? It kind of depends. Some are at that phase, others are a little bit more advanced in the process. Our One Ocean program, for example, they're a lot more advanced. They'd probably be looking for a series A or B round. But for the incubator specifically, I have made it a point to promote a, and help a founder what even if it's just at the ideation phase. So how do you how do you deal with that? I think it's a challenge like, you know, all these different companies like you can't have a one size fit all program, right? So what's for pre seed or idea is not going to work for A. So how do you make sure everyone gets what they want or what they need from you? Yeah, so typically with the incubator specifically, they're a lot earlier along in the process. So the incubator will really give them the room to grow. The One Ocean, that's specifically for international and specifically for those companies that are a lot further along in their process. So we kind of admit companies based off of where um, after looking at the applications and hearing the feedback from the review panels and everything like that, we will look and see where the best fit is. Um, with Tacoma specifically too, I will say the steering committee really, really does a good job of letting me know. They'll be like, hey, we think that this company is at the ideation phase, or we think that this company is a little further along, like they're going to get ready to raise the first few rounds here. But if Tacoma is a place that a company really, really wants to grow and establish themselves, I don't want to tell anybody no. So that's why, again, the open door policy is just super, super important, at least to me, because at the end of the day, you know, I am so thankful for the community that I have in Tacoma as well, because if somebody may not be a fit for the maritime incubator specifically, I could turn to one of our partners and say, hey, I met a great entrepreneur who is working on X. However, there might not be that maritime sustainability, climate tech, things like that fit. So here would be a recommendation for you to pursue this person's program. So the VC that invest in like maritime tech, are they in Tacoma, Seattle, the Bay Area? Like, you know, like, you know, if you want to do like software, it's like Seattle. If you want to do like media, it's, it's Los Angeles, you know? I will say the type of investors that I personally know that have been invested in the companies, I feel like they've been nationwide. Some of them might have international investors, but for me personally, I know there have been investors in Tacoma that have invested in some of the Tacoma based companies or at least expressed interest. There have been the Seattle VCs that have expressed interest. Some folks have gotten VC money, I know, from like the California area. So I would have to say it really depends on the company and who they're talking to. But Tacoma specifically, Yes, there have been there has been an investor that has expressed interest in investing in some of the companies, and I know they have made an investment in one of the alumni companies. Here's one for you: What is a a, a, a company that has not gone through your incubator yet, and you, you're looking for to come forward to like your incubator, right? Like they've done some like crazy maritime tech. Like, I hope that makes sense. Like they haven't they haven't come through yet. But like, man, I'm looking for a company with this idea to come through. This probably needs to be solved. Yes. So this would be a tougher one and i believe that somebody out there could do it it's probably not going to be me because again the engineering aspect is not there but one of the last week we took or a few weeks ago we took um the companies on a tour of the port of tacoma and they said when new cranes come in and get installed there's no way for the old cranes to leave so they just sit there what? so yeah so if somebody could figure out a, how's that possible in all honesty i have no idea but it comes i mean it's not like a simple actually a simple solution like that's what i that's what i thought too but apparently and i have seen this happen because when i interned in the port of tacoma 
I'm sure everyone has seen or everyone has seen, you know, the News Tribune and the Seattle Times articles with the the large blue cranes coming in on these ships, right? So the cranes will already come assembled from China. And then of you'll, course they come from China. Yes. You'll have to get them off of the vessel and then installed into the terminal. But for the older ones, they don't have a solution to um in, uninstall them or somewhere for these old cranes to I mean, go. I would say it's unbelievable because obviously it's happening with man. That's unbelievable. Yeah, that's what they were saying on the port tour. So if somebody can come up with a solution to um, safely. Yeah, if somebody can come up with a solution to safely, I guess, take apart the old cranes that are at the ports and then make either a use of them or efficiently recycle them somehow whoever comes in with the idea that idea is going to be gold because it will not just be i know it's a little out there but it it's won't like ports all over the world right right it won't just be the port of tacoma that expresses ports brazil right Ecuador, everybody will express Italy. interest so if somebody can come up with that solution i am waiting for it so what's any point of view what's more important someone that has like knowledge of the problem or someone has a passion for the problem Ooh, that is tough. And the reason why I'm I'm going to say that's tough is because if a founder comes in and if they have no, they might not have the educational aspects yet, but they have the passion, something that we really, really look for for our programs, Jason, is if a founder is coachable. Because if a founder is coachable- Oh man, like, I know you've seen pictures, I've seen pictures of like, like VC that like give feedback and then just see the ads for the dude, right? Or the guy, or the gal. Basically saying, I don't give a fuck what you say. I know what I'm doing. And then the, the VC is just like, okay, I'm going to do best you do. Right, exactly. But it, and I also have seen founders give the pitch, the VC or the angel or whoever in the audience will say, hey, this is what I think that you need to do in order to make your pitch captivating. And they say, okay, the pitch is so much better compared to where it was in the beginning. So for me, I think between the knowledge or the passion, I would just have to say, if the person is coachable, that's what we mainly look for because the education can come and the missing components that they might need can come. But if the, if the founder is not coachable, then they might not get very far because if they don't change, this is why I love Claire and I love Pat because they always really, really encourage me to think outside of the box and same with my boss. And if I just had this linear mindset, especially for the program that we're trying to build in Tacoma, that's new, I would not get very far. But for me personally, Jason, whatever feedback my boss, the CEO, mentors tell me, I will write, I kid you not, like I will show you my lovely celestial navigation even though i don't do celestial navigation but i will show you my notebook that is celestial navigation themed and whatever feedback or criticism or something that somebody tells me i will write that down so that way i know what i can do to help improve myself next time and then that's what i would like to have a founder do like have a notebook and the founders that are going through our program right now, I am so thankful that whether it's advice that I personally give them, my boss, the CEO of the company, all of them are just so coachable right now. It is it is a dream come true. We'll talk about this. This is not for founders, but like people are doing it right. I mean, in life, you're going to hear no so many times, right? You're going to hear no over and over again. You know, even as a little kid, can I have a talk? I actually, no. Can I have this job? No. Can money? No. Like, can you talk about the mental toughness you need to have to be a founder? Like, because it's not all unicorns and rainbows, right? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you need unicorn and rainbow, six months, I'll be a millionaire. And it's nowhere close to the truth, right? Can you talk about the mental toughness you got to have? Yes, 100%. So I was a cross country runner. Um, you will not catch me running. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. We're going to go backtrack. So you did all this crap. And you ran like 20,000 miles a week. Before. In high school, only in high school. I didn't, I was not, I was not an athlete in, in but college, still, but yes. Like, is there anything you did not do? Um, I'd have to think, <laughs> I'd have to think about that. I'd have to think about that. Well, I, I truly think you don't need two hours a day, maybe two hours a week, all the stuff you did. At Cal Maritime, um, if I was lucky, five hours would be my, my minimum. 
or my maximum amount of sleep, but I would, I would study or, you know, especially after basketball practice, I would get myself something to eat. You know, I'd shower or such, like prepare for the next day. Party in college too. Um, a little part of me was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that actually came out last week. Um, the, well, the funny story is, is that we took our, some people say that sailors like drink a, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. a certain way. And we took our, um, founders out for a celebration and I made the CEO of the company laugh because I like slammed my drink down on the table, you know, like a sailor and he just started laughing and he was like, the sailor has never left you. And I flat out said, I was like, well, you can take the, the girl out of the academy, but you cannot take the academy out of the girl. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Like, everything. But, but I will say, you know, being in, being a cross country runner, the thing that I had to focus on and I wasn't the best. Okay. Like I, I was, you know, it's almost five o'clock. Oh my goodness. The time has flown, but I, um, you know how they say you run a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. That would be the mindset that I have for a founder. And I guess one way to look at it is that I would run or when I would do the cross country races, because a lot of the times, at least in high school, unless if you ran the course previously, you didn't know what you were running in. Like I've ran up hills before which i didn't expect you know i ran down the hills i thought i was like there's nothing worse than running up a hill you didn't know it was gonna be yes there. yes because i was like oh my goodness am i finally to the end and of course like one of my most memorable races where i did have a personal record i had to run up a hill at the very end to get down to the bottom and i was like you i was like in my mind i was like you, you've got to be kidding me but i was like all right you know i was like what other choice do I have than, Not quit right, there. right to run up this hill? That's exactly what I'd recommend to a founder is because especially along the entrepreneurship journey, you don't know what's going to come your way, but you just have to keep pushing. It's kind of like a stamina type of thing. Like when I ran cross country, you just have to keep going regardless of how much you want to quit. Cause Jason, I ran in the pouring down rain before I ran when it was super hot. Like we live in Washington state, right? We can't predict what the weather is going to be regardless of what the forecast says. So I would say it's more of a mental game. And just because one door closes or if someone says no, or let's say you give a pitch to a VC or an angel and you really thought that they were going to give you money and then they, they ended up not for whatever reason, I said, as a founder, you cannot let the small stuff get to you and whatever, like when life hands you lemons, you've got to make lemonade out of it. Because if you can't handle that, then being a founder is not for you. Or it's like unexpected life events, right? Like for me last year, I was rear-ended and I was T-boned in less than a three month duration. And, you know, will I admit, was that hard dealing with the medical pain, you know, and dealing with the pain that I still have today and like having to ball out and like get an injury attorney and explain to like my job that this is, you know, like this is the reality that I have to face right now. Yes. Did I grow from that experience regardless of the pain that I might still be feeling and kind of learn just like a founder, like when something is thrown at you, you have yeah. to deal with it. Not only that, like simple stuff, like, you know, you still got to take a bath, hopefully, still got to wash your clothes, still gotta, <laughs> yeah. you, you still got to take your car to, you know, you, you don't have a personal sister yet, right? No. You still got to do this life stuff, right? You still got to, you know, if you're married, you know, you know, hang out with your wife and kids, do stuff for your kids. Like there's still life stuff you have to do something. Right, exactly. And I always encourage founders too, especially the ones that are going through the Tacoma program that a break and a mental health break for yourself is super important because at the end of the day, your company is nothing without you. And if you keep pushing to the point that you burn out, and then if you don't want to work on your yeah, company, anymore, odds are you don't have, you don't have the military strength and stability as Elon Musk, right? Right. Elon Musk is like a different, he's, a, he's an alien, right? Working hundred hours a week, whatever it takes to be has three or four different companies. Like you're not him, right? Right. And there's also like thousands of employees sometimes that you have as a startup starting out, you don't have that. So the most important piece of advice besides putting yourself out there that I would have to say is you really have to take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, your company is nothing without you. So I always tell founders like, look, whether if it's you pick a day 
of the week where you decide just to make it lighter on purpose. For me personally, um, I really love going to Sounders games and like hanging out with my friends. So that's, so going to Sounders games are super, super important to me. Like once you block that off in your calendar, do not let anyone else, you know what I mean? Take that time from you. And a lot of people said like, put in your account, like, like block time for yourself, right? You take your, take it for yourself. To me, the sound was, I think it was like it was two Saturdays ago, right? That a Saturday came on PM. Oh my God. It is like, it was so many people here walking, cars <laughs> everywhere. It's like, this dude was like craziness, right? I'm sure you probably saw me walk by, Jason. I was like, probably one of the people with my friends, you know, bundled up. We all got our, our jerseys yeah. or they call it a kit in major league soccer. So you probably saw all these Sounders fans like decked out oh, with, yeah. with, with their kids. And yeah, then it's a real thing. They don't, they don't mess around here with the Sounders games. We, we do not. And it's, 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 it's definitely fanatical without a doubt. <laughs> yes. And I sit in the supporter section. So if anyone looks for me at a game i sit in the supporter section close to the goal you'll probably find me singing like all the sounders chants <laughs> <laughs> in addition to the sounders chants too if something is not called for for our boys like you will hear like me and my friends like boo or or you know pull out our our so, little so referee like cards um well so when I got into my car accident, I played, you know, like when I was much younger. Of course. Of course you played soccer. Of course. That, of course. that, that was, course that was my mom, but, but I was not very good. And I did not take it seriously, you know, cause I was like, I was like five at the time, like trying to keep a five year old's attention for is hard, but you know, um, I really wanted to push myself to start doing the things that I wanted to do because, um, some of my friends, you know, are at different life phases than me um some of them are you know already have like they're married they have kids i'm not at that part of my life yet and then with the car accidents too like potentially you know it could have been a lot more brutal and fatal towards me than what it was but i really wanted to push myself to start doing the things that i wanted to do and this a really close family friend of of ours i would watch her and she was a big soccer fan and we went to a Sounders game like a very long time ago it was cold it was raining I didn't really appreciate it at the time and then you know I started looking for fun things to do in the area and become involved because I really like getting involved in communities and going to Sounders games was like one of the things that came up on like popular things to do. And I was like, I don't know if I should buy the tickets. And I was looking on like Ticketmaster's websites and I started like following, you know, the Sounders like social media accounts and everything. And then finally it was perfect because GeekWire had a Sounders night and a barbecue. So people would go, um, to people would go to the venue, which is like not very far from here or first mode first. And then after that, all, everyone would walk together to, to Lumen. And I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to take a chance. Like I'm just like being an entrepreneur. I was like, I need to start meeting more people in the tech community. And I was like, what better way to do this, especially with something that I've always wanted to do for a second. And, um, I was sitting in this section, one of my really good friends, his name was Kurt. He, he came late cause he was doing something. And, and I was like sitting by myself at the time. Cause I was like a lot of people left, you know, cause tech people, right. Like we grind and they were like, oh, it's so nice to meet you, but I have to go like work early. And I was like, typical, but I waved to my friend, Kurt and he came, he sat down with me and then he was like, fun fact, I actually work at Lumen. And he was like, I can take you anywhere in the state you, you want to go. Cause we were starting to talk business. And he was like, you know what? He's like, you don't seem like the type of person to be sitting in this section. And I was like, you're right. And then I, I was like, you're right. I was like, you know, it's a little too quiet for me. And, um, he was like, I can take you anywhere you want. He's like, do you want a suite? Do you want like VIP, what do you want to do? And I said, take me to where those flags are like, are waving and things like that. And that happens to be the supporter section. And he was like, 
do you know what you're you're gonna get into like they're singing there's dancing and I said I've seen enough I was like those seem like my type of people I said take me to where the party's at and he was like all right he's like okay and then ever since then Jason, like, because I took a chance and like, you know, met some like new friends in this process, I love sitting in that supporter section. Like, I love the singing that happens there. I love the dancing. I love the family aspect. Like, I never, I never wanted to leave. I go to a lot of them. So last year around the fall, around like July slash August, I finished out the season. Um, I filled out the little season ticket holder form and I bought a pack. So I got uh, the pack for the rest of the games oh, for the so year. Messing around. I yeah, I, I was not messing around. Right. Yeah. And then this year it's actually my inaugural season as a season ticket holder. So you will, you will catch me out there like <laughs> with my friends, the home opener. I was at the home opener. Um, in addition to the matches that they play at home, I'll also attend like watch parties if I can with my I friends. I thought you were about to say it. I fly to the different cities. I fly to Dallas and LA, New York City. Where I'm actually starting that. Fun fact, I'm actually starting that. So this coming weekend, um, the boys go down to Portland and play the, the, arch enemies. the timber. Yes, the arch enemies, unfortunately, like it kind of killed me a little bit, like saying the the timbers, but <laughs> <laughs> um this this coming weekend, the boys play the timbers. So I'm going down to, to Portland to watch the boys beat the timbers <laughs> number one we're number one in the western <laughs> um conference too right yeah, now San Jose, they're actually pretty good like haven't they won like two or three championships like recently like they like i mean they're actually a really good team right yes yeah they won um they have two mls cups so they won the mls cup in 2016 and 2019 and then no other mls team has won ccl or the Concacaf champions league we are the first mls team to do that and the boys won that last year so um i'm super you know i'm super excited that i like kind of got to experience that and now like with all the games with all the energy with all like the boys have been playing super well um i'm super excited that i get to witness this so i'm going down to portland this coming weekend to watch the boys um beat the timbers so i'm pretty sure you're gonna get the World Cup tickets yes and then um my friends and i do plan to to go to la in june and potentially like other <laughs> other spots too so we're for it yeah i want to i think most americans don't realize how how big soccer is across the world so when i was in the middle child station which is italy one time right a couple of years and then i can like, like a minor league soccer team right when they played with Chinsen, we were not allowed to go to Vicenza because if they lost there's a riot if they won is a riot they would like tear the whole town apart right no matter what, right? <laughs> they were not allowed to go to Virginia. So no soccer game, you got to stay on base, right? I mean, think that must seriously everywhere. Oh yeah, I believe it because as as you know, the the Portland and the Sounders rivalry is is pretty there. And last year, um, I took the fan bus down, so I did end up traveling to Portland, um, like I plan to do this weekend. And our fan bus broke down a block from the the Timbers Stadium. And some Timbers fans were were very nice to us. You know, they were like, okay. Other Timbers fans, Jason, they swarmed on that opportunity. Like they sure. they took they took advantage of that, and it was great. Again, another community bonding experience that I'll never I'll never let go. But we um, had to wait for a bus from Seattle to come pick us up. So wait, wait. the bus had to come all the way from Seattle. Yeah. The bus had to come all the way. From Seattle to pick us up and um I remember it was like 3 a.m that we got picked up you know because the bus had to come and of course when you travel by bus it's typically a lot slower than the ca a car or something so I remember um a whole bunch of like tired Sounders fans you know like I worked for the basketball team at Cal Maritime and unfortunately you know like when you lose like you just want to do the 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 travel of shame you know or this travel of sadness back home you don't want to deal with anything else and the fact that we had to deal with the sadness of losing and our bus breaking down was like a whole different shenanigan that's crazy so soccer is your release day like your, your mental health breaks in so to speak that and my wine club 
wine club. Don't, don't sleep on a wine club. So do you have a favorite wine, specific country, certain style of wine, anything like that? Or? Um, Fun fact. So my favorite sounder actually does have a wine club subscription. And of course, with my job being supporting entrepreneurs, he also started a wine business. So I get to not only support my favorite sounder, but I also get to support his wine business as well. Nice, nice. Um, so let's go back to entrepreneurship real fast. Um, so for for the incubator, what's the what's like the future plans, right? Like two more questions. Number one, let me ask this first. For the six time he's doing now, what's what's success from your point of view? Or is it from the race funds, like get traction or for at least six companies finish with success from your point of view for them? Yes. Yeah, so I really for the founders that would really like to achieve the funding, that would be a success to me. Again, not everyone looks for that route, but for the founders that would want to see the funding, it would be nice. It would be lovely to see all of them raise around, even if it was a very small round. Are you all invest in them at all? Or? So I am working on that. Um, as of right now, the, C the company is going through the ex Seattle Accelerator do get an investment. I'm working to have the Tacoma companies receive something because as an example, there's a program in Pierce County called the Pierce County Business Accelerator. And what happens is, is that um, folks that go through their program, they are given the ability to raise up to $10,000 and whatever Whatever they raise up to $10,000, Pierce County Business Accelerator will match. And I know that I think that comes through federal funding. So whether I could do something like that and obtain federal funding, um, when I was at South by Southwest too, yeah, I met. Yeah, we got to talk about that too. Yes, of course. But when I was at South by Southwest, we went to an ecosystem building panel, and it was perfect because I consider myself to be an ecosystem builder. And what the folks in Texas realize is that hey, there was government initiatives to help promote entrepreneurship, especially in certain parts of Texas, and they took that idea. And they ran with it to order to, to help startups get more of that non-dilutive funding option. I know it'll be a lot of work on my end, but if I could achieve something like that, it would be significant because again, I do understand, you know, as an early stage entrepreneur, you want to keep every piece of equity that you can. So that way, when it really does time or come time for you, if you have to raise around and give equity, the whole goal is to really have founders keep 100% of their equity while going through the program. Um, but success to me would really have a company really, really build and scale their business in Tacoma. As an example, I will give a shout out to Aquaga, who the CEO is Nigel Sharp. They really took what the program had to offer. So they did the program. I know. I know what they did. Yes, they were in. They were the first company that was admitted into the incubator and their first to graduate out. And Jason, I think that all they doing like a Kickstarter right now. Yes. Crowdfunding thing. Yes, something like that. I it might have just wrapped up, or I think they're close to that point. Yeah, but I saw them post on LinkedIn like they're like close to a goal or something like that. Right. And what, you know, I really appreciate about Aquaga is with their crowd funder, they understand that not everyone, because, you know, in order to be an investor, I know you either have to make over 200,000 or more annually, or you have to have a million dollars in assets. And for the average person, sometimes you don't have that. So what I really appreciate that Aquaga did is that they had that crowd funder. So if you don't, qualify. You still invest in yes, you can still invest in support in the admission of what Aquaga is doing. And, you know, Nigel and Chris and Brian, it, they really started off in the incubator with just the three of them. And now they've almost quadrupled in size. They found a permanent home in Tacoma and they're really building and scaling their business out. They've expanded their operations for their PFAS technology down at Petridge Marine. And they've gotten a combination of over a million dollars with 
it's, I know it's a combination of both dilutive and non-dilutive funding. Like if folk, I really, really want to see more companies do that just like Aquaga did. And I appreciate too that um, Aquaga is always for the community. So even though that they are no longer a part of the incubator, but of course we'll still it's help. Just community and right. Part of the, uh... And um, we've had school groups come visit us. We've had charter schools come visit us. Um, they honestly reach out to me too and see what they can do to help yeah, you and give back. Good up for yourself out there, and then people not reach out to you. You've done about that. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely put the capital E in extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, in this role, I have to be an extrovert for sure. Just correct for you. Uh, so, how how you deal with this? I'm going to make sure I answer this right. So you have six companies, right? And five companies that you really like, but you like really took the seals, whatever. But one company, right? And like. I would say they're jackass asshole, but like there's something about like, you know, of course you of course you have to like what they get accepted, right? But both is working like, man, like I really don't know what they're doing. This guy doesn't listen to me. You know, how do you like how do you like make sure you like treat all them equally and give them all the same support and it makes any sense? Yes. Yeah, so with me having an open door policy, again, we something that we really strive to do in the program is give our founders that one-on-one -on -one time. So again, whether that's a low stakes environment, like taking a founder out to coffee, happy hour, or lunch something so that way they can tell me what's going on in a in a less stressful environment that's one way that i do it another way that i do it as well is if a founder would want to have the traditional like hey let's set up the zoom call or let's set up a meeting you know the one-on-one -on -one time i always like to check in on our founders too especially the ones that are going through tacoma because um me being a Virgo, again, going back to the astrology, but one of the sign or one of the weaknesses in my sign is that I don't like to ask for help. And it's a common, it's a, it's a common Virgo thing. I just, that's my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> I have to help. Like you can see like, geez, I can help you. No. I'm yeah. I'm like, right. no, no, it's fine. And then of course, you know, people at Maritime Blue are, are like, are you sure you want to do this i'm like yeah yeah it's fine like i don't need your help in reality the help could have been nice but honestly i will i would tell people no so one thing that i really really like to do is to check in on all of the founders to make sure that they are doing okay in addition to help treating the companies the same i again really really harp and own on the aspect of community so one thing that i like to do is have fun outings with the founders to kind of help alleviate the stress and again in a in a lower stakes environment it makes it much easier mm -hmm. on me to kind of see what's truly going on rather than in the traditional you know office setting so we've we've gone out to coffee We've gone to happy hour at the networking events too. That's usually a good time to catch the founders to see what's going on. Um, I have offered, some of the founders have suggested that they want to go with me to a Sounders game. Um, and yeah, and I and I would welcome it. Um, we went to the Mariners game the yeah, other day. Like, I'm a Houston Astros fan coming from Texas, but I probably more, I'm, I'm not going to avoid more Mariner games than like Rangers and Astros games. Mariners game is actually fun, right? I mean, I I I, I, I think baseball game like I'm not a big baseball fan, so just like the atmosphere, the hot dog, the beer, the crowd, you know. Right, um, right, and that's what I really would like to do with the founders is activities like that. Um, especially too with the partners that I have down in Tacoma. Um, as an example, Startup Two Five Three with the director being Stan Nguyen, like we also realized too that the challenges that entrepreneurs go through. So if we can help promote a fun environment too, like mental health is such a super, super important thing for a founder. So we plan to do like paint and sip night. So that way it's like a different type of networking activity for a founder. So overall, just, I guess I'd have to say is finding different ways to connect with each founder and see what their interests are, like whether if it's workshops, whether if it's events, whether if it's outings, um, that's how I kind of really see what's going on. Here's one for you. I, I'm sure my ass is wrong, right? But how do you tell a founder, like, dude, or, or like founder, you, you're, you're fucking up right now. You, what you're doing sucks, right? Like, you got to change your game plan. You got to do something different. Like, how do you, how do you say a play for play for play, 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 play. Um, Virgos are very direct and we do not mess around. So I will blatantly tell a founder, like, this is not working. We've got to redirect you a little bit. And 
I personally, um, again, my mom is, is Filipino. So she growing up, she didn't sugarcoat anything. And I think that's where a lot of it comes from is she was very direct with me. I would rather be very direct with the founder because can you imagine Jason, if let's say I didn't say anything, I sugarcoated it. I avoided the question. And then they go to a VC or an angel for money. What do you think that VC or angel is going to say? They're going to, they're going to rip into them. And, um, sometimes, you know, I, if it's not me directly telling them, luckily I do have a great access of net, of mentors in our network. So again, like the, the philosophy that I like to use is as an example, math was never my thing. My mom would try to help me. We, it wouldn't get anywhere, but that's because she was directly close to me and, you know, her teaching style methods were not aligned with mine because she would shortcut. And for me, I can't shortcut when it comes to mathematical stuff. But when we hired a tutor or someone that was on the outside, but still had some connection with me, the progress and the retention was much more significant rather than my mom trying to do it. So that's how I look at it as well. If I cannot do it, that's okay. Then I will go to mentors, especially that work with a founder. And I will say, Hey, this is what's going on. I've tried to explain to this founder, you know, what they're doing is not working. Can you help me relay this message to the founder? And that, that works well too. Who are your mentors? So I'm talking about who, who makes it right now? Yeah. So definitely my boss, Josh Carter, the director. Yeah. Of blue ventures. Yeah. I could, I couldn't, I could not do what I'm doing without him. Um, definitely Joshua Berger too, who's the founder and CEO of Maritime Blue. Um, my mom, of course, Maria has a big factor in what I do. Um, my sister, Christina, who fun fact is an Ivy leaguer. So now I have to do, I have to build something out and, you know, compete with my sister. That's a, that's an Ivy leaguer. She does a lot of mentoring with me too, especially since my sister's older, you know, she has the work experience. Now she has the MBA experience. She'll be finishing up here in May. In addition to the people I just mentioned, definitely my godmother, Victoria too. And my godmother has a different level of resiliency because she's had health, um, a good amount of health issues come her way. But I swear like every time that there is a health issue that comes my godmother's way, I don't know how she handles it, but she just, she just does. And I was like, if anyone can be an entrepreneur, my godmother would be the perfect candidate. Cause I swear, like when life throws her cur curveballs, she'll just take a minute to reflect, but then she'll handle it. Um, also Visana Hoy too, who's a part of Maritime Blue. I really do appreciate her because she is also a woman of color, which is pretty uncommon in the maritime industry. So it's nice to see someone that, yeah, no, you know, not, we're not, we're not thinking about, you know, basically we're not thinking a white guy, right? Hey, a 55 year old white guy, you know, the scraggly bird, you know, sunburn, you know, Davy Jones, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. yeah, yeah. but she has really mentored me under my wing. And then, um, Pat Beard from city of Tacoma as well. Claire Petrich for, who's former port commission, and Purchase Marine, and then definitely two commissioners that are actually on board of Tacoma staff right now, Deanna Keller. Um, Deanna was a Marine. In addition to her being a Marine, she was a business owner. So she has given our entrepreneurs great advice. And then Port, Port of Tacoma Commissioner Kristen Ng, she is actually a woman of color, and she was actually the first woman of color to be elected on the Port Commission in 2019. So kind of putting everyone's perspectives together, like I have folks that are entrepreneurs, which is much needed, especially with the work that I do now, um, women, you know, breaking glass ceilings and overall the maritime expertise too because um some some of my colleagues think that i have a lot of maritime knowledge and i'm like i have nothing compared to what jo joshua has so yeah, yeah. so i'm gonna sum up there was a second follow-up question for next but i don't want to tell the story first right so i used to go like deep sea piss out of west once a year right as a young one year when my son a couple of friends right 
a question that you take a small cooler of beer or whatever before whatever. And so you have to be there at 5 a.m. The vote means at 6 a.m., right? We got on the boat, and these two dudes, right? I mean, like, you, you just tell them there's a whole lot of this here, right? They look, they look sea worthy, sea worthy, what the word is, right? And then this, I mean, they had the big ass cooler, right? And so we got on the boat at 6 in the morning. At 6 30, the one old dude got to the other guy, hey, do you think we get started? Well, I think we should have started way before now, but yeah, we can start now. These jokers broke out a gallon of raw turkey. A gallon of raw turkey, right? You know how raw turkey smells. It's just that like smell, right? <laughs> gallon of raw turkey and had a case of safer life. That shit was gone. They started drinking at 6 30, that shit was gone at 7 30. And they caught all the fish. <laughs> like, they caught, like, folks caught 100 fish, they caught like 95 of them, right? And we're, we're like, it was all for sea sick and stuff, you know, like, now the smell, we can't take it. There's like, take a shot, take a shot, shape for like, shot, shape for like. We're like, we're like, in, like, I'm talking about mind blowing, like, what the hell's going on right now? And talk about punch alcoholics, like, you can't even tell them they're doing a water cooler, right? And like, yeah, it's, yeah, that's the craziness. So the second part of the question is like, and your answer can't be, um, who is in the incubator? And you're like, that, but who are you mentoring? That's not in the incubator, like not in the program. Like who are you and your mentoring? Yeah. So I really, really take that seriously. And the reason why is because again, you know, when you asked me, what would it take for the younger generations? I mentoring and people help guiding me was super, super important. So in addition to the work that I do outside of the incubator, I've actually taken it upon myself to become involved in various youth groups. So previously I mentioned I was um, in the Sea Cadets and the Sea Cadet program really, really helped me and helped define who I was. So now I actually went back as an adult volunteer to help guide the next generation of cadets, whether they want to go. And I always emphasize in that program, even if you don't go into the military afterwards, a lot of the kids that pursue the sea cadets do go into the military. But I always say, even if you don't go into the military, it's still a good program to pursue because you learn responsibility, you learn leadership roles, you learn how to problem solve, quick thinking, and all of these skill sets that I learned early on where some of my peers in college, like they never left home. They didn't know how to do their laundry by themselves and things like that. So I mentor a group of the sea cadets. In addition to the sea cadets too, I char I mentor at a local charter school called Why Not You. Um, I don't know if you know this, but that also happens to be Russell Wilson's charter school. That's not the reason why I picked it, but um, I do a program with Why Not You called Leading to Learn. And what happens is you go to Why Not You Academy, or of course, you know, they make you go through a background check. The program is ra actually ran by Big Brothers Big Sisters, which is a commonly well known mentoring program to connect adults in the community with kids in the community and some of the kids could potentially come from underserved backgrounds so what happens is i go to why not you once a month and i have a mentee that i've had for about a year now which is pretty neat because within the big brothers big sisters program after your one year duration is up with leaving or with leading to learn you can actually take your mentee off-site so if my mentee wanted to like go to the movies or ha have me help her get ready for prom or things like that I can do that because the one year duration is up and um so I go to why not you once a month we do mentoring activities such as like team bonding we played games there and then I kind of get to check in on my mentee too, to see how they're doing. And what's really nice about that is because why not use a bit or a smaller school compared to the average school? I've gotten to know my mentee's teachers really well. They've let me know when my mentee is potentially struggling or needs help. Or if they say, hey, like we've tried to reach out to your mentee with this aspect, they weren't really answering us. So do you mind kind of listening in, you know, or letting us know what she's, she's dealing with in some type of aspect, but 
And in addition to the Leading to Learn program as well, um, I've actually brought Why Not You students to the incubator to learn about entrepreneurship and to connect with our founders as well too. Last year, it kind of started off on a smaller scale. We had my mentee and a friend of hers do a job shadow visit. So they kind of got to see what a day in my life was like being a program manager. This year in last month, actually, a group of Why Not You students came, did hands-on activities with the founders. Then, you know, we made it fun. So there was like a prize involved and we provided lunch and things like that as well. Um, in addition to uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters and um, the Why Not You Academy, there have been just different youth that I've connected with um, in Maritime Blue because we have a program called uh, the Equity Engagement Team. And what they do is that they really, really help those underserved youth get their foot into Maritime. So in the summers, we have the Youth Maritime Accelerator Project, which is pretty much an internship program. I've taken it upon myself to take an intern every year um, I, so far I've had two, from like high school, college, or... um, anywhere from 18th to 24. So sometimes they'll be wrapping up their senior year. Other times as a paid internship or yes, it is a paid internship as well. And, um, there are requirements like the resident has to be usually within the South King County, um, region, but I've taken it upon myself to have a intern every year that I've been That's with Maritime Blue. So or the paid unpaid, like, and I a lot of people say, like, yeah, don't do unpaid, but I might think, like, most stars can't afford a paid interest, right? But I think as long as you help that person get a job afterwards, right? That's good. Yes, that is, that is key. Paid would be uh, nice, yeah, of course, yeah. right? Because I have done an un, unpaid internship before. It wasn't ideal, but fun fact, it actually was an entrepreneur, and I didn't really understand then, you know, because I was broke. And in college, but now that I help entrepreneurs, I could definitely see I, why. I mean, what do you really have? Like, suppose you have a paid internship, right? Like, suppose you have an intern, right? I'm paying like twenty dollars an hour, and you, you get my coffee, you do my dry cleaning, answer my phones, right? And that's it, right? But you're unpaid. Like, I'm like giving access to everything. I'm introducing the people, right? What's what's more valuable, right? I would say the unpaid and the experience. Now, of course, like experience. things like that, like people say, like you know, like people like it was, uh, what's the word it was for, like. Uh, like bad economic background, you know, that take money, whatever. So it's unfair, whatever. So mm -hmm. it's, it's it's not that easy to do, but yeah. It's yeah, it's really not easy. I mean, when I had my unpaid internship, I was thankful that like I had my parents' support. So I was able to do that. But I do understand that not everyone. Yeah, you, you know, for unpaid is definitely advantage, right? Because, you know, yeah, my thing is, I won't say I'm proud of all my interns. I was able to get a job, right? Some kind of way, right? So I'm proud of that, right? But a lot of people, like, you know, everything we paid, unpaid, like, Make my coffee, you know, do this bullshit right now. <laughs> <Get the fuck laughs> clean, <out. laughs> clean. I've I've had I have had my my fair share of internships when I've had to clean. I mean, it I made decent money, I'm not gonna lie, but it, it was like I, I cleaned or um they didn't wanna collect like parking meter money or something. So it was me driving with the police officers, like collecting the bargain meeting, my yeah, inner money. Done, here. Right, where paid on paid, it definitely like gives you an advantage, right? Yes, it does help. And I will admit to um, both of my interns have been women of color, which has been really nice because, and I kind of strive for that. And the reason why is because growing up, I had my mom and I had select few people that look like me so if i could provide that opportunity for somebody else to be their mentor right it's super important and um i've i've had my intern see what it's like for doing events networking throwing yourself out there especially the intern that i had last year the year before the intern was lovely too but unfortunately because it was 2021 and you know the world was slowly starting to work um so are you going to bring on intern anytime soon I hope so. It it really depends on um, you know, if there's a fit as well with so what I do. Let's but suppose someone's out there they want to be an intern, right? They, they're into the maritime, like what do they have to do to get attention, apply, what what ground back that I have? Yeah. So I will say, just like an entrepreneur, um being coachable and willingness to learn is super, super important. So even if somebody doesn't have the maritime 
background, but they're interested, they can definitely reach out to me and then I can connect them with my coworker, Robert Brown, who really is in charge of the internship. But our internship is pretty, pretty neat because what happens is that Robert really does a good job of teaching the students soft skills. So everything from being on time to, you know, being engaged. And um, if the meeting is on Zoom, having the camera be on and actively listen to the the speaker because soft skills sometimes, and then Jason, I'm sure you've met. When they say soft skills are actually the hard skills, right? Yes, it, they actually are hard skills and not very many people realize that. And those are important. The soft skills are just as important as the hard skills. I believe, but Robert really does a good job of going through like elevator pitches and like how to introduce yourself and how to professionally email and excel and things like that. So they'll be with the students will be with Robert in the morning and then they have a break for lunch. And then, um, the employee, the interns are with the employers, usually Monday through Thursdays from one to five. And on Fridays, what's pretty neat is that we take them on different field trips for different exposure for the maritime industry. So last year we did Argosy crew, our, the Argosy cruise, and they kind of got to see what it would be like potentially working on a small cruise vessel. We did Washington state ferries and the students got to go up on the bridge as well as down in the engine room. We've done um, Port Townsend in the past and Port Townsend is a very maritime town. So they got to visit the, the Northwest Maritime Center that that was out there. And they also got to do a, a simulator to see what it was like to actually drive a vessel. Um, it was funny because the, the students ended up, um, cause you can kind of, as you know, you have to be able to drive a ship in any and every type of weather. <laughs> so it was funny getting to watch the students. They're like, oh, let's make it snow. So then they'd make it snow, you know, and then they'd be driving the, the vessel out in the snow and they were like, oh, like now make it rain really, really bad. So the, the students made it rain. And it was funny because, um, one of them was like, I want to crash crash the ship into like another one. So they would like try, try to speed up, but it was so much fun watching them get exposure through different types of the maritime industry. And then of course, to getting youth involved is super, super important by getting regardless of who you are out on the water, because again, like Tacoma, for example, is such a maritime town. And when you ask people, how many people have actually like taken advantage and like gone out on commencement bay or gone on a vessel and had gone on the water like some oh, people you just walk down western ray right right it's so beautiful there. some people are like no so um we've taken a group of students down to tacoma both years that i've had um an intern or pretty much my three-year anniversary with maritime blue will be in december so it it's really nice to see the students, you know, get to go out and about on the water. And even as an adult for Tacoma, that's something that I'm trying to do is to just get people out on the water because the common thing that I've noticed, whether if it's working with kids and or adults that sometimes just don't know, um, I'm like, tell me, like, what do you know about the maritime industry? And they'll be like, yeah, like you have to be on the water. You have to be on the boat. You have to be in a ship. That's not true. Um, especially during the pandemic, how I like to kind of phrase this to people. I was like, well, remember during the lockdown when people had to stay home and a lot of people had to rely on online shopping curbside pickup or other forms of getting goods to your house without leaving. I said, essentially, I said, that's the maritime industry working for you. And they say, really? And I said, well, yes, because long story short, like the goods start off on a vessel and then they, it pulls into port. The employees or the longshoremen will unload the cargo and then after they unload the cargo it'll be the massive semi trucks that everyone yeah, gets annoyed you know, they have like a problem like the, all the goods being backed up because they I, I don't know like especially california there's kind of track or something's going on like they, they backed up stuff for like ridiculous long time so hopefully that's fixed by now I'm sure it is i heard it's getting better um my friends that work more terminal 
based or shipping agent based because I have some friends that do both. They say that it's it's busy and so, you know sometimes things get backed up, but it wasn't as backed up as um, what it was during the early phases of the pandemic. And keep in mind, I just want to disclaim that I don't work terminal <laughs> terminal side, so um, I only get to see it, you know, from like the perspective of friends. So, how good of a swimmer are you? Um, I can swim, but I personally do not like the water. And what I like to tell people is, yes, I work in maritime, but I'm more shore side. So even if- So do you have to like, be, do you have to like pass a swimming test through the colleges like that? Yes. So at Cal Maritime, they, um, they make us go through an orientation week. You know, you get your lovely khaki uniform and your sea bag, and then they make you wear these this was when I was going, but I know they changed it. They made you wear these lovely khaki shorts and you had to wear like white tube socks and white shoes and then a polo and, and a baseball Cal Maritime hat. But during that, the orientation week, you do have to pass the swim test. If, like, like how far is the swim test? Like 200 meters, 100 meters? Like I think it's, I think it's a hundred. Yeah, it's 200 meters. So what they had me do, and I remember this, I remember this. I felt so bad. Um, they had us go into the room. They explained, you know, what positions, um, like they tested your crawl stroke, back, backstroke, breaststroke. And then the last a hundred meters down, you can do, you could just do whatever you wanted. And, um, you could do it in whatever order you wanted to, which was nice. But I remember they, they brought us all into the room. They kind of gave us you know, a low down. And they said like, Hey, if you like stand up and if they, if we see you like stand up, cause they understand that sometimes people get tired, but they're like, if we see you just like blatantly stand up and like, you're not swimming, then obviously you're gonna, we're gonna like say, Hey, get out. Like you're not going to pass. Um, they had the, they had all the lanes open and they were like the shallow, the shallow end, you know, the middle and then the deeper end. Um, some of my friends, they ran like straight to the deep end. I was like, nope, I'm getting into the shallow end <laughs> personally, but they, um, they, they would watch you swim. And because again, I don't really like the water We're very much. Um, it's been a minute. <laughs> it's been a minute, I will say. But I know when, uh, when I was in the army, I was the officer can school. And part of the can school, you have to you have to jump, you have to put all this military, all this stuff on, right? You have to jump the high dive. Now I'm not a good swimmer, right? I'm a pretty weak swimmer. I like man. And so like they ask you, can you swim? I, I thought about that line. I think I can't swim, I, mean, I can't do it right. I'm, I'm an officer can school, I can't lie. So you have to go to the high diving board, like I'm really like, like the Olympic diving board, right? And all your stuff on, jump in the water take everything off underwater, come up and say like a bunch of bullshit, right? And go back on the water, find everything, put it back on right in the swim out, right? So if you- and like I could never do that again, right? If you were a licensed cadet and you were going sailing, yes, they would make you do something like that. So I remember um, you would have your khaki uniform on and um, this is just me again, living through friends. Cause I wasn't licensed. <laughs> so, so I did pass the swim test by the way. Um, cause the guy asked me, he, so the, the blue chip meant that you passed afterwards, the white chip means that you, you failed and you, um, but they encouraged all the cadets, regardless of your major to, to learn how to swim. So even if you, you know, were not licensed, they would offer swim lessons, which is pretty nice. But um, I remember I did my, I did all those strokes and I personally, me being a Virgo and a planner and with my mom kind of hounding me, I would practice, like I practiced. Yeah, yeah um, I realized that swimming is not, that's not easy, right? Like it, no. It, it takes a lot of, you know, you just like one or two laps of the swimming pool, like that's, that's, yeah. that's harder for real. It's, it's, I mean, Michael Phelps looks like that for a reason. Yeah, it's a lot. And um, they wouldn't, they like, for me personally, I prefer goggles because I like to see what I'm swimming on but they didn't um they didn't let you have goggles and I was like oh no you know and I was and when I was practicing I would swim with goggles on but um they would they pretty much said okay so they gave us the lowdown and this guy was like what if what if I can't swim and everyone thought that he was joking so everyone started laughing and the guy was like no seriously like 
I, I can't swim. Like, do you still, you know what I mean? Like, do you still want me to get in the water? Do you still, and, and they said, yes, like everyone has to get into the water. And the guy was like, but I, you know, like I can't. So he got in, he got in and then he like got the most shallow lane. And then he just like stood up and was like, I, he's like, you know, I, I can't, like, I'm going to have to take those classes, but um, I did all my lengths. And then the guy, you know, I, I got out of the pool and the guy was like, what major are you? And I was like, oh no, it's like, here he goes. Like, this guy's going to tell me that I, I, fa- I failed the swim class. I failed this like swim test. And then I have to like take the class. And I was like, oh, I was like, I'm in business. And he was like, oh, okay. And then he was like, well, he's like, everybody's swimming, like skills could use some work. So he's like, if you have time, like, I'd recommend that you do too but he was like but and then he handed me my blue chip yeah and I got that little slip that said I didn't have to take the swim class and I was like thank goodness for me it was over but for my friends they would have to take a class called marine survival so just like you were saying at the they would have you go you know after you learn the basics and everything they'd have you go like full-on in khaki and then they make you jump off of the the high ledge and then you would have to like take your pants off make a flotation device and then also to um in addition to that they want to see that you know what you're doing in case if you have to get in a life raft so after you did all that you know all that you would have to there would be a little life raft in the pool and then you'd have to get in stay in there a certain amount of time. I watched this and I was like, you'd have to stay in the the life raft for a little bit. And after that, you'd have to get out and you'd have to flip the life raft. Yeah. And I said, You're oh, like, thank God it's not me. Yeah. I said, oh no. Well, they, they were trying to make us do it for this leadership class or for a leadership class. And um, everybody has a different style of leadership. So thank goodness, you know, my leadership professor wasn't like, everybody's getting in the pool and like flipping this life raft but they were like some people can be leaders from shore side and other people can be leaders in the water so um because I worked a lot with the basketball team I worked for the women's team and then I had really good friends on the men's team we all had the same schedule so right away we were like hey we should just form a group of us so that way if we have to miss class all of us are missing class instead of, you know, so-and-so or, oh, like I had basketball and there would be like six of us missing from different groups. And at the end of the day, you know, we didn't want to screw any of our classmates over. So um, the day came and, or the class before we were supposed to do it came and they were like, um, so the professor was like, who's getting in the water? And then me and my friend were like, we're saying, yeah, I was like, we're staying on the dock. And then um, the three basketball boys that were with me were like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. Like, we'll we'll get in. And I said, I'm not even arguing. I said, if you all like want to flip the raft, like you all, <laughs> you all can flip the raft. Well, when you do this, you know, I, just, I saw it on YouTube where I can be like, the people in the neighborhood, they'll be out of the sea for like six, four, five months. They take a break. And like the all like and all like jump off the fair deck, whatever, like, like 10, 20 feet, right? Like I cannot imagine doing that, right? First of all, I, what's in the water? Like what's down there? I have no idea from the water, right? And like, you know. Yeah, that's that's honestly a part of the reason why, because fortunately, being in the Sea Cadet program, I got opportunities to sail underway, not for the full deployment, but for chunks. So one of the experiences I got to do was I got to sail on the Coast Guard cutter. Um, the midget, I believe, is decommissioned now, but I got to sail from um I got to sail the first time just around Elliott Bay. The second time we actually got to go from here to San Diego. So like the first week of their deployment, which was cool. And then um I got another opportunity later down the road to sail on the Nimitz, which was an aircraft carrier. Yeah. And I got to take the helm at 16, like, which is pretty neat, but yeah. And not very many kids get that opportunity again. Cause if you, that's not cool as hell. That's cool as fuck. Yeah. Thank you. Cause 'cause if you don't, you got video pictures of it. I think I have pictures somewhere, but it was, it was neat. Like I got to, I got to sail 
underway. Um, we got to sail with them the last week of deployment. So we flew down to San Diego and then got on board with them in San Diego. And then we sailed all the way to Everett. Um, but yeah, they were saying like in Bahrain, like people would just jump off of like certain parts. Yeah. And- you see the videos all the time, like that kind of man, like, like I'm saying I was about like, told someone said, Jason, jump off or, you know, or we'll pay what's we'll land. Oh, I might take my chance to go so late, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm here, our, our first time when I jump off in that case, right? But man, like, I could not imagine, right? Yeah, people would, and then um, some of the friends that I met that I'm still pretty in good contact with from the Nimitz, they're like, yeah, like people would just jump off. Like it was hot. They'd like do it again. And in my mind, I was like, what is in, what is in yeah, the, water? the water? Right? That's I what mean, I you know. Let's do a scan of the water first. Like what's down here? Like the shark, or what it could be like. And then like other high up, like you don't hit it right. That shit hurts, right? Yeah, that that's what my fear is too. And then- um, Can you imagine doing a body belly flop for that high up? Ooh, <laughs> no. Well, people would do belly flops because sometimes, you know, um, what was definitely different from being in Vallejo versus being up here is like late October, early November, it would still be hot sometimes in the Bay Area. So they would open up the pool, you know, some some days and people in the diving area. And I would just see kids do like all all this shenanigans yeah. like off of the pool and I was like no thank you I was like I'm just gonna stay and they would have like floaties out so I would just be like chilling in a floaty while all these people would be doing belly so the craziest thing I think kids do in a swimming pool is like and they would do some perfect right like uh, one kid would like high dive and high dive over right and he would jump then the kid would run from the side and try they would try to hit him <laughs> I I would see a little bit of that shenanigans, but then the lifeguard would stop it right away, like stop the fooling, stop the fooling around. They'd be like, no, what are you do? What are you doing? That's crazy. Um, so South by Southwest, y'all went there with Capital Factory, right? Yes, we rented out did a. You, did you meet Christy? I think it was Christy Liotta. I did. I did actually. Oh, I like her, like, fan, yeah, she was actually. I think did she you? was on one of the panels that I. I attended. Person. Yeah, she was very, very nice. And it she's was really very, like supportive, very like open, but very like, you know, like, yeah, she's like she's one of the good people as far as the like, DCs are concerned, in my opinion, you know. Yeah, and I also around here too, I've met a lot of VCs lately that have been women, which has been very cool to see. Um, and some of the investors too have even came down to Urban Waters and given feedback or have you met Yoko Ono. Yes, Yoko is actually oh, the one that that came down to give yeah, our yeah, founders so feedback. Much. Yeah, like if I get invest, I'll, I like I want her to invest. My company that's like you know that she just yeah she's fucking great. Yeah, she is somebody that I would want. To, well, oh, yeah, she wants to want to start sure. team, no doubt. Yeah. So back by South by Southwest, how long were you there for? So we were there about five days. Okay. Um. So we we kind of left when the entertainment stuff like started happening what what, what, what the fuck doc doing right <laughs> tell him that, tell him that That's next year you're supposed to be there for the entertainment yeah so when you were there like what kind of were you able to do any fun stuff you go to barbecue joints or go to sixth street or also sit limits like doing tourist stuff or, like could be startup business so it was mainly startup business but fun fact because i don't really eat um that type of meat i was able I was, I, I did, I did. So I was able to eat. What do, y'all, what do y'all go to? Oh my goodness. I am blanking on. So. Uh, I am blanking on where we went. Was it like a famous place? Or is it where you're about to be? I think, I think it was a little mixture. Or was it like, so the two famous ones, there's just Franklin's. That's like, and Franklin's like, it's like, it only opened like 11 to 2 Friday. Oh, I Saturday. think we went to Black's. I think we went to Black. Okay, Black, that's a good one. Too. Yeah, we went to Black's. I had some sweet tea. Well, and I was nervous because everyone was teasing me. You know, Josh and Joshua were teasing me. They're like, what are you going to eat here? And I was like, well, I'm I'm going to have to eat this and, and see what happened. So, um, so I'm not a big fan of Terry Black's. So like, to me, it's like sea salty, right? But I know a lot of people might like it like that. It was um for me it was it wasn't bad like i i got a little bit of, of the brisket my stomach handled yeah, brisket, chicken. yes my stomach handled that okay yeah. but when it came to chicken my stomach was not happy with me when i yeah, ate the so chicken terry blacks uh, frankly is good and there's a place like a 30 minutes ago called salt Lake, right and salt Lake, like you pay like i'm making this up 
it, it's a two-hour wait to get to get inside, right? And like you pay like fifty bucks, it's all you eat, right? Oh my goodness! Fifty bucks, all you eat, all you drink, right? And they actually sell bison ribs. The bison oh. ribs are like this big, and it's so it's so good. We went to a Waffle House for the very first time too, because I personally yeah, experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've never went, and yeah. then one of our international founders from One Ocean was with us. So he, yeah, he he got to go for the very I'm a first time. If you, if you work at Waffle House as a waitress, you you need comment pay. <laughs> you need comment pay at Waffle House. Nothing wild happened when when I was oh, wow. was there though, but um. I posted some of my, I posted, I was at a Waffle House and some of my friends were like, uh, like, what are you doing there so late? And I was like, I've never been, but in all honesty, it is, but all honesty too, Jason, like I'm very, very weird. Like I don't like my waffles to be very, very thick mm -hmm. if I eat one. So the fact that the Waffle House one was like yeah. very, very thin and simple to eat. Um, and Waffle House, they didn't, they, they didn't really have a different uh, theme of cut and serve, right? So me and my family, we came, we came to Italy for a while. We came back to the States to visit my our family, right? And I saw in, in, in Dallas area, right? My two kids, like, hey, we're kind of hungry. Can I get some breakfast? Yeah. So Waffle House, like a six minute drive, right? We go to Waffle House, order eggs, whatever, whatever. And one kid asked, hey, can I get some cheese? Well, I asked the lady, uh, can I have some cheese, please? You know, you were thinking, like, bring some Parmesan cheese. <laughs> or we could be. This joke brought back craft singles still in the plastic. They came with my son. Why well, start looking at me like that? I will never eat this place again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I will admit, um, I I wanted like chocolate chips in my mm -hmm. waffle, and I asked for chocolate chips in my waffle, and I didn't get chocolate oh, chips. Yeah, that's in my waffle. But but that's okay. That's okay. The waffle was still good. The food is like excellent. The food is good, right? But it's like they do their thing, like you know, like if you think about them, because somebody defending themselves, it's like making sure the customers are taken care of, right? They think like. If you're here, like, what a time it is, you're probably drunk. We don't care what's going on. Why you <laughs> I was trying to convince both Josh and Joshua, because I are one of the Sounders friends that I sit with. He's from Texas. So he started listing all these places that I needed to go to. And I tried to convince them to to go to Bucky's. I don't know oh, if you're yeah, familiar. Bucky, yeah, so like, but but they weren't for going to Bucky's. <laughs> yeah, Bucky's a different atmosphere, too. Like, everything. Okay, we think it, you can buy crayons, food sweatshirts everything in the buggy right yeah right yeah board games i and then the bathrooms are actually clean too oh, yeah, which is like you could like you could actually eat off the floor of the bucket bathroom right not saying you know y'all would do that you know but like oh you drop some food oh shit that's 20 seconds where i'm good right yeah i there's definitely a lot more you know if we do go again which i'm hoping so um i definitely want to go to bucky <laughs> were you ever like doing it like go to sixth street or like go to uh, do doing the music stuff um, not really. I think we walked down sixth street once, but because, you know, we, it was a lot to since I mean, only five days. Yes. Days, you know. And then we had the event at Capital Factory. In addition to us having the event for Capital Factory too, South by just has so much to do. And again, I'm thankful that like I got to go to this all like this women's event and we all kind of shared like vulnerabilities and like what we were doing and like what type of business. Like yes. The connections alone were super worth it. And in addition to the connections alone, the yeah, overall experience was fun. The entertainment, how much of a good time you would have had. I think some of the, I think some celebrities were there when I was there. There's always big celebrities and stuff. Like, just like dropping new records and no like people singing like the tech stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, I actually, we were waiting for one session and I got so excited because uh, Josh was like, Mark Cuban's going to be here. Mark Cuban's going to be here. And I'm super excited because I yeah, personally yeah, watch. It's a really good speaker in person. Yeah, I watched Shark Tank too. But unfortunately, um, we made a mistake. The session didn't end up being his, which I was kind of weirded out because I was like, why are there like this, like less of people if it, yeah. they were waiting for Mark Cuban? But when we were waiting for one session, I actually got to meet like Olympic gymnast Sean Johnson, which was okay. pretty cool because I was like looking at the panel. And I noticed it, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, that's Sean. And Josh was like, oh, go get like a picture with her. So I got a picture with her, but I didn't realize like how, I thought that I, like I was kind of shorter for the girl, a girl, yeah, but I didn't realize, like short, yes. Like, I didn't realize yeah, how short yeah, she was. It's like five foot tall, that's like too tall. Right. I didn't realize like how- Five foot tall, 75 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. like probably not even 75 pounds. I had to bend down. Cause when I was trying to take a picture with her, 
I was like, oh, I was like, sorry. <laughs> and I had to bend down because I didn't. You know, you, you felt good for a minute. Like, I'm tall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I didn't realize like how tall and how petite she was. So I was, I was like, can I get a picture? And she's like, yeah, sure. Like, of course. And I was like, oh, I was like, my bad. And I like had to, <laughs> I had to bend down it. To. That's crazy. I was thinking I had a good time at Spa Southwest. Yeah, and that's my bucket list thing to go there, like to do the whole thing, right? Like the, however long it lasts. Honestly, it's such a great city, right? It it great. was, but it was a lot colder than I expected that it was so going to be. Like in February, March, Marchish. Like so people don't realize Texas is cold, right? Texas, like it, it, we get ice, you know, a lot icicles, right? It, it gets cold in Texas. Like, it, really no, I didn't. Well, the first day it was super, super hot, and I. That's the problem too. Monday, 95 degrees, Tuesday, 37 degrees, you know? Like. Yes. And it was cold. And then of course, you know, they blast the AC inside because if they, if they don't blast the AC yeah. inside, then it's going to get really, really hot. So I would always, I'm glad that I brought a jacket with so it me. It doesn't like being in Texas in July, 95 degrees outside, got to wear a jacket inside. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly how I felt. <laughs> yeah. And so you're thinking I'm going to go there for year? We hope so because there was so much startup so activity. Why, why, why did y'all go? What, what was the purpose y'all going? Yeah, so um, Josh and especially Josh, he realized that you know because he has been a founder in the past. There, there was two conferences. He said that as a founder, he didn't miss every year. One of them was CES or the Consumer Electronics. And y'all paid for everyone to go there, right? Um, we. How so how it worked is, um, we paid for the activity portion of or AKA the capital factory. And then I think everyone had to make their own accommodations to, to head out there. So that either drive their new cells, supply them new Right. Somebody actually, or one of our partners from California actually did make the drive. And I was like, wow. I was like, that, <laughs> that's a long journey. But Josh realized that because, you know, he was a founder and there was two conferences that he didn't miss every year. One of them was CES. And then another one was South by Southwest that there was so much activity and so much that a founder could benefit from by going attending South by Southwest. So we had founders from our programs attend South by Southwest. And then we had partners from Braid Theory, the Scripps Institute, um, See Ahead, which is our partners in Boston. So we pretty much had all of these people working on new innovation and technology in maritime come rent out an event and actually a lot of people came up to josh and the partners afterwards and said there should be you know more innovation and technology in maritime represented at south by southwest so some people would say like kind of feel like south by southwest or tech conference with the other way actually a waste of time right like you should be building your product building your business blah 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 this kind of stuff is like more fluff, right? What would be the response to that? I have heard that response actually. And I personally don't think it's a waste of time because again, being an entrepreneur is all about putting yourself out there. And the more that you put yourself out there and the more connections that you make, I personally think the better off that you'll be because especially as an example, the reason why we work really, really hard to put our Tacoma founders in different audiences in front of different audiences is because there's only so many people in a certain area that you can talk to. And it's kind of like an olive branch kind of, you have to extend your olive branch out to places, even though you might not expect, because you never know where those connections will lead you. And especially being a founder, again well as an example um jeff bezos right he started amazon in in his basement but if you take a look at his basement from where he started in his basement to now he ships pretty much all over the place but i'm sure that didn't happen right by him just staying in the seattle or the pacific northwest area that happened by him if it wasn't him personally he had people to expand the offerings out and that's really really important to do as a founder because especially in the maritime community too it's really really nice to know that like if our founders want to start establishing connections for example in san diego we have connections in san diego if they want to go to the east coast or to the gulf we could reach out to our partners at sea ahead in order to do so so i personally don't think it's a waste of time because again the more audiences and the more that you can tell your story effectively in front of different types of audiences the better off that you'll be and especially the people that I personally met at South by like I met Chrissy um the VP of 
Esquire Philippines like walked in to our event. Yeah, yeah you never know who's going to be those type of things. Right. So it's definitely not a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. So, so let's say I, I, I'll call it maritime tech, right? I love the right term. So let's say we'll go back to year 1800, right? Has there really been a lot of investments in maritime tech since 1800 to now? Like, of course, besides like the GPS, like all the satellite. Is it is maritime like stuff selling boats, but it's still the speaks the same as there's actually been a lot of investments? Well, especially in the tech sector, I definitely see a lot of investments, right? Because, for example, the sextant first, people would have to navigate by the star for from the sextant, but now there's um technology on the ship that allows you to do that. And then, well, for example, before the vessels, right, you would have to actually sail sail them and rely on the wind. And now you have a motor that will actually help you get farther along than where you could by just relying on the wind, especially in the sector two that we are in. There has been so much progress, like anywhere from helping combat supply chain issues because one of our startups in the second wave, like that's what his company does is help combat supply chain issues at a much more sustainable route or for the logistics side too like trying to electrify the vehicles in the fleet a company does that um one of our companies too in the one ocean accelerator they realized like if there is rain and all this stuff on the windshield that might block somebody's view to sail effectively so the fact that they're developing the technology in order to do that is is truly significant to me and at cal maritime i will admit they kind of touched on this stuff but it was hard for me to see even because i wasn't you know boots on the ground like i am now seeing these founders invent all this this neat stuff so i will say there's progress but i know with progress every you know, sometimes the maritime industry is a little bit slow to change, so they're just going to have to adapt to the progress. So let's talk about you, Christopher, right? I obviously love you doing a case of me, but I guess you don't want to be doing like next 25, 30 years, right? Like, what's your career goal? Like, what do you want y'all become like a like, managing director of your own incubator, like start your own company? Like, what's your career goal? Yeah, so funny that you mentioned that. A lot of people say that they see me starting something um, and being like the CEO of a company. Um, I always joke back at people and I'm like, okay, well, when you find the idea for me to start, like, let me know. I'm, I'm waiting for it. Um, I definitely do want to go back to school because for me personally, education has been a super important aspect of my life. And personally, you can never that'll make your parents happy. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. That'll make my mom, <laughs> that'll make my mom extremely happy, but I really want to go back and get my MBA or my master's of business administration because do you have a school in mind you want to go to? I don't yet. I don't yet. But I thought I wanted to go to to New York University for a little bit, but That's now a lot of fucking money. it is. But That's now it is. Now that I'm not sure, but I know I do want to get my MBA because I heard especially being an entrepreneur, there are components that will help you. Um but this is like me dreaming um if i come across a, a big lump sum of money um one thing that i've noticed is that early stage entrepreneurs especially ones from underrepresented groups often have a harder time obtaining capital compared to somebody that has traction has connections so eventually if i could start a fund or work for a vc or an angel or some type of firm or a fund, I think that would be something that I'd want to do. So you're saying you had to start a bug and that can leave me anytime soon. I don't think so. No, especially with the type of work that I'm doing. Everyone's going to say, everyone's been telling me like the more that I'm around the ecosystem, the idea will come. And they said that they can't wait to hear me say that I'm, I'm starting X company, but I definitely need a CTO for sure. And that's such a challenge, you know, not tech founders, these tech people like, uh, so that's, that, that'd be a whole different episode. Right, um, right. But but I'm glad too right now that I realize that I can't do the technical component because there are some founders that, you know, they might think 
they can be a CTO, but in actuality, they would be better in a more CEO role and bringing someone on that has the technical experience or vice versa. So I'm just thankful that I, I'm steering in my, my lane right now, and I'm not going to try to build a, an app or something tomorrow. So we we'll take on this, like, you no, know, the, the people say, fail fast, go as quickly as you can, you no, know, and then, and then they'll say, well, you won't be a millionaire in six months, right? It's like, like, to me, it's kind of like, how, how can you fail fast? And then be told like, you gotta you know, grind it up six months or a year, right? Or two years, right? How does that make sense? I would have to say failure is a part of the journey. That's how I would interpret that. Failure is a part of the journey. And as long as you learn from your failure, failures, that's what can cause you to keep grinding. Because especially for the founders, right, that just clear, see one way and they don't want to look any other way or they don't want to go down any road. I feel like that's what would make it hard with the founders that, okay, they say, maybe I learned from this. I'm going to take what I learned here and pivot to another direction. That's how I would look at that. Again, it's just like the philosophy is unexpected life events, whether if it's medical things, car accidents like me, which was a combination of an unexpected life event and some medical stuff. But you just you just have to learn how to adapt. And if as a founder, you're not adaptable, there's going to be a long, hard road. So I'm talking about this. I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize this, right? Like, of course, you know, you're going you're gonna to work your startup, like, how long it is, right? People don't realize, like, when you first start, we really get paid in money, right? Of course, you say you can money equity. But of course, that's like saying, hey, Karina, I'm going to give you a product building rainbow, right? It's part of having, right? So you can miss people to work for you, right? But odds are, they're going to probably do it for six months, right? So how do you, like, deal with, okay, I have this great team, but, man, I can't pay them. They got bills to pay, and they left for six months, right? And, they, and they're great, and they got to replace people all the time. Like they're grinding, right? How do you, like, deal with that thing that's about, like, keeping your team, uh, like, always going or whatever it should be, you know? Yes. So some of what I personally witnessed is that some founders will have a, a day, a day job, unfortunately, you know, until they can get the company up and running, right? As an example, if you take a look at Joshua, when he started Maritime Blue, he was not only working for the governor's office, but he was also doing Maritime Blue until he was really able to get the grant funding running. I will say when it comes to aspects like that, you need to hire the right people. In addition to hiring the right people, you also have to hire the people that really, really believe in what you're doing to make to make them stay. So I know with that, people say, oh, you hire A, a plus people, right? Well, first of all, everyone's not an A plus person, right? And like, can you really hire A plus person? Because they want $100,000 a year with this week, right? Is it better like hire maybe a C plus person and get that kind of stuff done and then hire A plus person? Or like, how do you work through that? You think, right? Yeah, I would say, um, especially for the newer companies starting out, I think a talent pool that gets slept on a lot is new graduates. And I can speak for this for myself because, you know, Jason, when I was trying to get my foot in the door, just like a founder probably hears a hundred million times a day, oh, you don't have traction. You don't have this. You don't have that. That was me. That was me three years ago when I was looking for a job especially for the top maritime employers that, you know, I would come close or I would fall short. But the number one thing that they would tell me is that you don't have enough experience. It's not that we don't like you, but and, come and back. It's, and it's like an entry level job, right? Yes. Entry level job, five years experience, blah, blah, blah. Like, are you fucking kidding right now? Well, exactly. And in my mind, I was like, I understand that I don't have the experience, but how do you expect me to get that experience if nobody's willing to give, give me that experience, you know, to show. So sometimes Sometimes, yes, I will admit you do have to hire somebody that might not have the A plus skill set just yet, but if they're willing to learn and that's where a new graduate could come in, like they might not have all the skill sets yet, but if you're willing to teach them and if you're willing to learn, the potential could be endless. Because again, for me, right, what happened was, is I was interviewing with companies and this was at the end of like 2020. And I honestly, you know, sometimes just just like being an entrepreneur, it was hard for me to see the end of the road because I applied for so many jobs. I spent so much time putting in countless number of cover letters. All I would hear was no, 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 no. So then 
Do you know what happened to me though? Literally after I signed my contract with Maritime Blue, a very prestigious co Maritime ca company came back to me and they said, you know, like we thought about this. Um, we like what we you have to offer experience wise. Um, this is what we're really gonna offer you. Like we'll start you off down at our training facility in Oakland we'll have you train for a year and then we'll put you back to Seattle. So that way you can go work up here. And they're like, is that something that you're interested in? And I was like, if you would have caught me five days ago, yes, exactly. I said, if you would have caught me five days ago, I said, I wouldn't have had a contract in hand and I wouldn't have signed an offer letter, but I was like, unfortunately, like I have to stay loyal who I signed a contract to and I was like if you would have came five days sooner I I would have but I said I I can't accept so you had a as a, 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 a call as a carrier right and the military is not known to be entrepreneur right at all right you would be so how do you make how do you like get into this entrepreneurial stuff sort of going from that back coming from that background yeah I will say um the joke when I was younger, it was like, I could sell ice to the Eskimos because my brother and my sister would have all these fundraising events. And it was usually me going out to sell like the cookies or the, the candles or, um, I growing up too, like my parents really instilled the heart, the foundation of hard work early on. And they were like, okay, if you want this iPhone or whatever, like you need to raise the funds to go get it. So what, you know what I would do? I would go around, I would dog walk, I would babysit for money. Like I would have to say the, the hard work. Hey, what did you grow up at again? I, I grew up in Tacoma. So I grew up in Tacoma. So yeah, I would go dog walking. I would babysit for funds. Um, and then that kind of taught me the hard work ethic early on like if you want something you know somebody's not going to just hand it to you like you have to go out and work for it and then after um you know kind of like my experience of selling like the cookies the candles and whatnot um one of the things that I did early on in in high school was I was a sales associate at a party store so I'd have to upsell <laughs> people all the time, you know, whether it was balloon packages, making a banner, invitations, poster boards. So it was a little bit of that too, that kind of got me excited, I guess. And then um, at Cal Maritime, one of the things that I had to do was represent the business department. And I would pretty much have to like, let not only some of the basketball girls know that we're potential recruits coming into the academy and potential just overall, like to the public as to like why they should come to Cal Maritime. So in a sense, like I was selling the, the academy experience or um, in addition to the academy experience too, like every year, you know, leadership positions, seniors would graduate and then we would have to to help recruit people to fill the shoes of the seniors that were leaving. And again, you know, like I would have to sell like why it was important to work for housing, like why folks should consider working at the finance department, why folks should consider the international business program. So there's always been me promoting something, I will say, like very early on. So I'm, I'm gonna play this video real fast on YouTube. Who is this lady right here? She is Tamsin Bell. She is um a, a vice president from the economic board of Tacoma slash Pierce County. Great partner to have. How old is this video? Oh, it's very recent. Um, January of this year. Okay.
Are they ever going to like do something with City Hall and that City Hall building? I think so. I think one of our partners. I remember Eli was going to do something. Yes, I think he's. That's still in progress. Yeah, that it's still a work in progress. I know he plans to do something with it, but I think it's it's currently in a work in progress at the moment. Yeah. So is there anything I should have asked you? I haven't asked you anything you want to talk about. Honestly, no, I, I can't think of anything right now. I feel like we went through so much. Yeah, we did, we did, we did. Um so what what is is your like it could be like June to June, January to December, like as a time frame. Yeah, so I feel like it kind of varies. Last year, we graduated about all the companies out in August. And then I, because the last company that, that was admitted, since they were kind of all admitted at a sporadic basis, the last company that in entered the incubator was in August. So after we graduated the last company out, I personally yeah, said, so you got a little break, right? Yes, I got a little Probably. break. So we started the 2022 um, to 2023 cohort in November. So they are with us from November of 2022 to November of 2023. And then I have a feeling for 2024 to give myself a break. Um, we're probably going to do January of 2024 to have the program start. But the overall goal is to admit either the five or six companies before then. So then that way, once. So is the future plan like kind of be like tech stars? Like, no, is it future like you have like a, they could bid all the like one in, one in, one in like Tacoma, one in Beaumont, one in Baltimore, like have like all the four cities that have incubators there? I hope so. And I think what, with that too, there's going to be partnerships that are most likely involved. Cause I know there's programs in the East coast, there's programs in San Diego, there's programs in the Gulf and those folks are already our partners. And what is nice is again, if somebody may not fit in one of their programs, we have gotten referrals in the past for them to come to us and, and vice versa. And again, to being a founder, like the best gift that you can receive is education. So if you can go through one pro more than one program, I'd highly recommend it. I think going for you, like, you know, quite, it, it's entrepreneurs do everything, right? Marketing sales. I think most entrepreneurs should put myself second sales. Man. I mean, like, you got a cold call, like no one's to do that. What kind of training you do in your incubator, like make sure like entrepreneurs like actually do sales, like cold emails, cold calling, whatever what sales, how, what kind of training do y'all do for sales? Yes. So I definitely recommend, again, the network events are going to be key, right? I always tell our founders, especially in Tacoma, Hey, like have either business cards. If you don't have business cards, if you have little pamphlets, some type of method that folks can communicate with you, because I've noticed in Tacoma, the face-to-face -face interaction is a lot better than the just straight up cold call. And that's true, right? So that way, instead of you just trying to cold call and reach out to Tote, you could say, oh, hey, it was nice to meet you from this event. You know, I would love to discuss further how our companies can collaborate or how my product could potentially fit for your company. So the face-to-face -face interaction is something I definitely encourage. Josh too also has classes in the accelerator and the folks from Tacoma are more than welcome to attend. So last week, as an example, they had a how to raise your seed round class with a, with an actual VC. Um, he, Josh has offered like the LinkedIn navigator or the sales navigator class two, which is super interesting. He's had marketing and sales professionals come in and teach classes before too. I think another one that founders really, really need to focus on is SEO, which okay. SEO, I'm not even a master at that, but Josh will have um, SEO experts come talk to the founders. In addition to what I just mentioned too, I always encourage the founders of self-promotion. So I'm like, Hey, if you have a LinkedIn, you better be posting on that, on your LinkedIn on a consistent basis of what you're doing. So that way as an, cause what's great about LinkedIn, right? It's not like Instagram where you have to follow the person in order to get the content. What's great about LinkedIn is let's say I like something that you post 
and people in my network can see that I like something and then whatever you're doing can spread to a mass audience. I always, and Jason, I'm sure at our networking events, you'll probably see me in the background at some point, like taking pictures of yeah. founders and their interactions. And then they'll be like, oh, well, I didn't get pictures of myself. And I'll be like, that's okay, because I got the pictures for you. So here's this picture, create a great, you know, caption or something that captivates people in order to like and share your content on LinkedIn. Cause yeah. I have found Jason like valuable connections right. on LinkedIn and it's based off of like people in my network, liking different aspects. And I, that's why I always sell founders. Yeah, problem too with that. Don't get me wrong. Some of that stuff is trash, but uh, like, when I, when I, like it's supposed to be stuff is trash. You gotta take it down. You know? So I asked one more time, anything else you want to talk about? Anything more? Um, all I would like to say is thank you so much for this experience. Um, this is my first podcast, so this has been so much fun and I, um, I hope to work with you again soon. So can you give me a social media so people can reach out to you? Yes. So I have a LinkedIn, um, it's my handle is kind of long. I apologize. It's Karina Martia Harris, or one way to easily get a hold of me is Karina at maritimeblue.org. Or you can look on Maritime Blue's website. And again, my my first name's Karina. My last name's Martia Harris. And my picture is also on the website. So if folks want to get connected with me then too, I'd be happy to to have them connect with me and reach out. Yeah, for our of travel or next to the so, Karina, thanks for being there. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great everywhere.